Call of Cthulhu, Edge of Madness, is a Call of Cthulhu 7th edition actual play podcast presented by DM Fiat with me, Dale, as the keeper of arcane lore. Please be advised, Call of Cthulhu is a dark game of cosmic horror. You'll hear descriptions of gore, depravity, helplessness, coercion, and other serious themes. This is not D&D. This is a game where we stare into the abyss and confront things that stare back. Death rattles, please, everybody. (laughs) 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 Welcome to our very possible finale of Call of Cthulhu, The Edge of Madness, part three of Mansion of Madness. And this specific episode is entitled The House of Dreams. Oh no. The end game is upon you. You're on the way to Muskrat Rapids, Pennsylvania. On the trail of Josephine Garcetti and her unfortunate captive, Andrew Keatling. We're working under the orders of the mysterious crime lord, Ezekiel Zeke the Geek Crater who has tasked you with obtaining a strange black stone from Garcetti. A stone that he claims is a family heirloom stolen by Garcetti at one of his wild parties. Vera was the first who noticed Zeke the Geek Crater is not exactly human, at least not anymore. And so, as you prepare to do his bidding, to chase your quarry, Josephine Garcetti, you all have this strange sense of foreboding hanging over you. The sense that even if you find Andrew Keatling alive and well, and save him from a fate worse than death, you're playing with forces that you cannot understand. So, we start the session here at the historic South Union Station in Boston. This is one of two main train stations in Boston. The South Station handles all trains that travel to the south of the city, down across the eastern seaboard. The South Union Station was opened to the public on 1898, and the Boston Globe called it the biggest railroad station in the world. Indeed, as you step off the streetcar that's brought you here and join the crowd of people making their way into the station to catch the late afternoon train. Even with the sense that 
you're about to throw your lives away in chase of something from a nightmare. You're floored by the grandeur of this massive neoclassical building. You step inside to the opulent waiting room with its myriad electrical lights, extremely modern fixtures and the grand lion head fountain in the very centre. There are stores and restaurants flanking both sides of the waiting room. Barber shops, clothes stores, bookstores. But you don't have time to relax. It's just shy of 5pm. And at 10 past, the New Haven Express to Pennsylvania will arrive to squirrel you away to Muskrat Rapids. You stand on the platform, contemplating the things to come. And... It's as if only seconds pass. You're broken out of your reverie by the sound of a great hiss. And you look up and see the hulking behemoth locomotive rolling into the station it slows down and comes to a stop and then the doors on all the carriages slide open conductors dressed in blue uniforms step out and call out all aboard you stand up from the park bench that you're sitting on on the edge of the opulent waiting room and exchange furtive glances with each other. This is it. This may well be the last time you ever see Boston. Any thoughts? Goodbye, Boston. <laughs> yeah. Hello, new adventures. Angel knows that she's bound for grand new adventures and if it should transpire that she does not return, well, Angel, you know you'll be in a better place, for your God is waiting for you. The time is nearly at hand. Vera, Buck, Trixie, as you're about to step onto the train, look over your shoulders, take one last look at the Boston skyline. Do you have any last words of encouragement or farewell yeah normally normally Vera would be excited about a new adventure as well but less so these days so she just sort of looks wistfully over the skyline and she too says goodbye Boston goodbye Boston steps onto the train with Buck following dutifully behind her Trixie. I didn't think I was gonna miss the side of this place, but yeah. go out. You've always stop. You've always sort of felt confined by the city, Trixie. You've enjoyed recently getting out to the great outdoors, and that's where you know the real mysteries lie. That's where the real secrets of the universe can be found. In any other occasion, you'd be excited, just like Vera that you're embarking on this adventure into the unknown, but as you take one last glimpse of the skyscrapers of downtown Boston and step onto the train, you can't help feeling a strange mixture of sadness and dread. You squeeze down the aisle through the middle of the carriage and find some seats towards the back of it that are unoccupied and as you shuffle into your seats you hear the conductor on the platform outside blow his whistle and then the doors slide shut there's another loud hiss as the locomotive engine roars to life and the carriage begins to judder and shake as the train carries you out of the station. Screaming past the banks 
stock brokers and high street department stores out into the outlying leafy suburbs and before long into the untouched rural countryside and seemingly endless expanse of deep green and primeval wilderness. The journey on the train is relatively uneventful. It's going to take just over 14 hours for it to carry you down the east coast of the continent to your final destination. You'll have to retire to one of the sleeping berths at some point as exhaustion starts to take over. But until then, the train ride is in spite of the situation you're in, relaxing, somewhat comforting. It's nice to hear the soft voices, the conversations of the other travellers as they discuss holiday plans, business trips, as mothers shush their children and try to contain their excitement over travelling on a train. Vera, you have photos of all of the important documents that have pertained to this case so far. This is probably as good a time as any to pull them out and study them and put together a plan. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, definitely looking over them for anything that might be useful. Yeah. So, as you reach into your bag, you pull out your notebook and the stack of photos you developed last night in Trixie's apartment. On top of the stack are the various pictures of that strange occult tome that Ezekiel Crater was in the midst of translating when he called you into his office. These you hand over to Angel and Trixie so that they may spend the train ride trying to translate as much as they can. And then you and Buck start to go over all the other evidence you've collected. So I would like Buck and Vera to please make intelligence checks for me while Angel and Trixie get us started with some Latin checks. A E one, is a success. Success, yeah. All right, we'll see if. Uh, what check was that? Sorry, I was just, rummaging for my dice. Just intelligence. Int just intelligence. I passed. Yep, Vera passed. She, she's getting to the bottom of the case. She's gonna get her pull it. So if she makes it out of this one, uh, that's a pass. Pass. <laughs> and links. Oh, that's a four. Yeah, cool. that's a very good pass. So, as. The train rockets through the countryside. Buck and Vera sort through all the photos, the pictures from Andrew Keatling's estate, that photo of, that the painting of strange oceanside manor, white paint peeling, flickering away, the garden overgrown, and when you stare at it for long enough, it's almost as if hundreds of little red eyes stare back at you from the windows. Seemingly innocuous image of a street light on the corner of a city block. The strange monster that you all saw there did not appear in the photo. The passages from the scriptures of the Riven Valley that recount the ancient history of the land upon which the town of Muskrat Rapids is built, that before the white settlers came, the natives had a legend concerning a being that dwelt somewhere in the shadow land of the hills that could contact those it wanted through their dreams and command them. That when an old man by the name of Martin Garcetti built his manor 
right on the edge of this land, strange things began to happen and the town's history was marked with a series of strange killings, massacres and suicides. Josephine Garcetti's diary explaining how she began to have strange dreams as a teenager an unknowable entity contacting her in her sleep, wishing to teach her things, teach her knowledge that mere mortals could not ken, how she devoted herself to its service and on its orders travelled to Boston. Travelled to Boston to locate and according to Zeke Crater, steal the legacy of the Chapel of Contemplation, which her ancestors were once members of. Trixie and Angel. It takes more than a few hours, but you manage to translate the majority of the Latin text that's visible in Vera's pictures. The book concerns an object known as the Dark Stone. It says, the Dark Stone is a six inch long lump of polished dark brown crystal carved to suggest the form of the thing hanging in the void or the one beyond. It was constructed in prehistoric times by a priest of the Lemurian civilization whose dreams had been touched by the one beyond. The dark stone, once impregnated with the proper number of human souls, will allow the one beyond to draw nearer to the real world where it can feed upon the human souls it relishes. Discovering the hideous plan of the Lemurian priest, his fellow Lemurians murdered him and buried the stone deep in the ground, erasing all records of the object and all records of the priest. The book states that the stone lay buried for millennia until, until the true servants of the One Beyond, yog sothoth would be called upon to unearth it and wield it once more. The possessor of the Dark Stone is said to gain special powers granted to them by the One Beyond. The first power is the ability to drain a victim's youth and life energy. The other power is to open a portal to the world of dreams where the one beyond dwells to allow those marked by him to be summoned to his court where they, will, where they will dwell in eternal paradise. Finally, the book states that should the holder of the stone manage to conduct a series of exactly 23 sacrifices in the name of the One Beyond, they may enact a ritual known as the Assumption of Night, which causes the dream world to spill forth, piercing the barrier between realms, combining the material world with the world of dreams, placing all who live within it at the mercy of the God of the Chapel of the Contemplation. The book states that it is impossible to destroy the Dark Stone, for it laid in the earth for thousands of years. But, if it is placed in the hands of someone who does not truly believe, that it will shatter as yog sothoth the one beyond will have no conduit 
through which to grant his faithful powers so that they may carry out his will. Buck, though. You don't care what the book says, do you, Buck? You're committed to finding a way to get rid of this stone once and for all. You know, uh, the new information is kind of rattling around in his brain, contesting for um the number one spot. He wants it destroyed, but he's not sure if he can believe that that would actually work. Yeah, like if you destroy Feeling a rock faithful by book. It. Hmm. Can I use my skills in psychology to try and twist Buck's mind. Well, psychoanalysis would let you do that. Psychology would just give you a general feeling of how Buck is feeling, and you can go ahead and roll that, and I'll tell you. But there's also the question of. Oh, that's a fail. Fail, yeah. Buck's just staring, he's looking out the window, watching the countryside roll past. His face, as ever, is a neutral mask of determination. Occasionally he reaches into his jacket, pulls out his flask and takes a sip. But Angel, at no point does he talk to you, or even look at you. There's also the question- You want faithful, Buck? Faithful about what? Depends nowadays. Mm. Yeah, I just well, think. Do you believe that. in dreams? I believe we have dreams. Well, then you believe in the world that Yogg-Sothoth is in. See, no matter what, you believe in dreams or something you're connected to. I and believe I need no a dream, what. especially after listening to your rambling. In fact. So you may as well just give in. Let it happen. I mean, dreams... Sure, must this... today, aren't you? Yeah, well... Lynx, Trixie, you're noticing that Angel is... Ever since she stepped on the train, she's sort of been very giddy. As she's tr helped you translate this text, her eyes have almost gleamed brighter and brighter as she's recounted the words you've just heard. There are a lot of questions rattling around in all your heads. Placed in the hands of a non-believer. What exactly does that mean? What is a believer? What is belief? You know now that things exist beyond mortal reckoning. That things that could very well be classed as gods are real. It's hard not to believe in what you've seen with your own eyes. But you can make a choice whether you fight against those things or seek to do their bidding. After a while, the countryside turns from a deep green to purple to grey as the sun sets and the sky above darkens. Night falls and one by one the other passengers in the carriage get up and yawning <sighs> start to make their way down the aisle towards the sleeping berths in the next carriage. There's no clock in the train carriage, but after you sit and discuss what's to come for a few hours, you determine that it must surely be close to midnight at this point. You feel the exhaustion starting to set in, finally fighting against and overcoming the sense of foreboding and anxiety that festers in the pit of your stomach. And you decide perhaps you should retire. You don't have to. You can try to stay awake. But who'd like to retire? Um, first of all, I'm wondering if there's any chance that uh, Vera can get anything more out of the like the books she has, uh, her notes. Ah, her notes, oh. yeah. 
So I'd like. She's to kind of the type who would stay up late trying yeah, to figure shit out while she yeah goes over what she's learned. So I'd like you to go ahead and make an education check for me. Mm. Um, at the pass. Pass. All right. Before I describe anything, Buck, Trixie, Angel. Do you stay with Vera as she pours over her notes, or do you accept the call of exhaustion and retire to the sleeping berth? I just sit there. No, if I fall asleep, I fall asleep there, but... Yeah, fair enough. I'm sitting Angel there. stays there. Seeing that Angel's there, I presume, Buck, that you probably aren't willing to leave Vera alone with her. Absolutely not. Absolutely uh, he hasn't not. been sleeping a whole lot lately anyway, yeah. so he'll be um, up late drinking, like usual. And, Thank you, Buck. And Trixie, since everyone's staying here, you decide you may as well sit up with them all night. If you end up falling asleep, you fall asleep. It's not as if you're sleeping on a cold, hard floor. The train seating is soft, comfortable, and perhaps it's best if you all just sit together. Vera pours over her notes and whenever you catch a glimpse of her notebook all you can, all the rest of you can see uh, snatches of messy shorthand that are all but indecipherable to anyone other than Vera. Vera though, you're good at taking notes. They don't need to be readable for anyone else. They only need to be readable for you. And I do a check um because I've got skills in anthropology and maybe kids might be pondering what this thing about belief could be and what... Yeah, go ahead. You can make an anthropology or an occult check. Sixteen is a pass. Yeah. Okay, so, Vera, as you go through your notes, you end up quite fixated upon the interview you conducted with the flappers in the sailors club the strange story told by the girl who called herself bobby about the raucous orgies that zeke the geek crater would hold at his cliff top estate how josephine garcetti seemed to seemed to take to these like a duck to water, would revel in them as hard and as fast as Zeke would himself. It was like they had some sort of supernatural vigour and would almost compete to see how many people they could bed that night. How she began to grow uncomfortable when she witnessed Zeke bite the heads off living chickens spraying their blood over his face and how she and the other flappers stopped attending these events altogether when they began to hear rumours that more sinister rituals were afoot and it was just about this time where Josephine Garcetti made the acquaintance of Andrew Keatling. And, if you can believe what Zeke Crater tells you, this is also when she acquired the Dark Stone for herself. You feel a shiver run down your spine, Vera. The rumours of strange occult rituals being performed at these bizarre parties You've got the feeling that Andrew Keatling is the 23rd, the final sacrifice. Meanwhile, Trixie, you ponder the text that you've spent hours translating. In your experience, when religious texts refer to non-believers... They're usually just referring to one who does not serve the God's will. However, given that this is a God of dreams, 
and most cultures ascribe much significance to dreams and that the mystical properties of dreams are an almost universal belief across many cultures. It's very possible, and this is where you find yourself smiling, that it could be referring to one who does not dream. Your eyelids start to grow heavy as the night wears on and as you continue to pore over your various documents and clues I'd like everyone to make a constitution check for me please thank you uh, that's a pass uh, a critical pass critical pass critical pass <laughs> critical pass Trixie I rolled a six I rolled a three uh, 17 of 60 yeah pass we did well, alright. The gentle rocking of the train on the tracks begins to lull you. The upholstery of the seat is soft and you feel your body sinking into it as your eyelids grow heavy and your heads begin to lull. Eventually, you all fall asleep, exhaustion taking over, but you don't fall deeply asleep. It seems like no time has passed at all. You don't even have time, really, to dream. There are flashes. Flashes of something that you remember later as you're jolted awake. Vera, you see a silhouette of a man in... An empty white room. He's fuzzy, blurring, wavering as you approach him. And as you approach him, he turns around, revealing his face to be nothing but a mouth. A mouth that is smiling as he says, I have the answers you seek, my niece. Trixie. Your sleep is plagued with visions of black stones, black trinkets, all carved out of the same crystalline black substance in a variety of different shapes and forms, each of them laying on top of sawdust in rows upon rows of wooden crates. You wonder where you are. And then you look around and you realise you're in the entrance hall of the Boston Museum of Arts. All of the paintings, the sculptures, all of the adornments that would usually be on display are gone. Replaced with twisted black, shapeless effigies that seem to shift and twist and refuse to hold a steady form. And Angel, your sleep, your sleep is blissful. You see a great bright void in front of you. A sense of overwhelming peace settles into your body and an unseen voice whispers in your head my faithful you are the vessel come to me do not reject my gaze for you <laughs> are the vessel why well, reject a gaze when I can be as open I need let your mind <laughs> remain lies beyond and then as suddenly as it needs yep. to be. and then suddenly the carriage violently jolts over a bump in the track and you're all jerked awake <gasps> the lights in the carriage are out 
takes a few seconds for your eyes to adjust to the pitch darkness and for only a brief moment you find yourselves wondering why the lights are off, why the carriage is utterly deserted. And then, fading into clear view, out of the shadowy haze, materialises a humanoid figure, standing between your two seats. Angel and Trixie, its back appears to be to you. All you can see is the long flowing fabric of its thick coat and the brim of its fedora. But Buck and Vera, as this figure slowly fades into view, you see it reach up with a clawed, stubbly hand and lift the brim of its hat, revealing that rubbery grey flesh and smoky lambent pits for eyes underneath. You've all seen the monster, so go ahead and make sand checks, but you won't lose much sand because you've already seen this thing. Uh, it's a fail. That's a fail. Uh, success. Success. That is a success. Success and links. That is a pass. So for a pass, you each lose one sanity. For a fail, one d3. Oh, three. The strange figure smiles, bearing rows of razor-sharp pointed teeth and then it raises its clawed hand and prepares to attack what do you do? Pips is gonna try and jump up and grab the clawed hand yep What is your dex, Trixie? Um, that is a fail. I'll push that. Well, no, I'm just asking what your dex is. Oh, my dex is 40. 40? Okay. So, we'll get to that in a moment. Buck, Vera, Angel, do you do anything seeing this thing raise its hand in an obvious motion to attack? Yeah, Buck's gonna kick it straight in the chest to try and uh, set it off balance. Yep, and what is your dex, Buck? Uh, 70. 70. Okay, Trixie, Angel? I stand there and I say... Oh yeah, sorry, Vera. You really want to hurt the vessel <laughs> of the one of dream. Yeah, you just... Vera would just be cowering. Yeah, Vera's just... Vera's frozen in place, having failed her sand check. She opens her mouth to say something, but all she can manage is a gasp. And then, Buck, you rise from your seat, and as you rise, it's as if you're moving within a dream. You rise in slow motion, your limbs are heavy like lead. And as you pull back your leg and raise it to kick this thing right in centre mass, you nearly stumble over. Meanwhile, the thing's claw comes slashing down through the air at full speed. I would like Vera to go ahead and make a dodge check for me. And do. Uh... Oh, I'm pushing that. Pass. Critical pass. Critical pass. Ooh, nice. 
So I. <laughs> so what did you get? So I will. Re- I will actually reduce your critical pass to a hard pass because, as you see the claw bearing down on you, you go to duck to roll out of the way, shuffle into the seat that's been vacated by Buck, and your heart skips a beat. Just like Buck, you seem to be moving in a dream. It's as if you're in one of those nightmares where you try to run, but can't. So I'm going to roll it. It's going to need at least a hard or critical pass. And you're lucky. Willing your body, you seem to lift up to defy gravity and land with slow motion in the seat next to you as... The claws slam into the seat, tearing through the fabric and spilling stuffing all over where you, where your head was not one second ago. The creature growls as it raises its claw, turns towards you and prepares to strike again. But then, Buck's foot slowly travelling through the air strikes it. Buck, go ahead and make for me a fighting brawl check. Uh, That is a hard pass. That is a hard pass. Okay, so I'm going to roll for... Yeah. Yeah. So despite the fact that It feels like your body's made out of heavy metal. Your aim is true. You feel the tip of your boot strike the monster, hitting something under its coat. You hear the sound of cracking bone as the creature stumbles for a moment, stepping backwards. And this is enough time to allow Trixie to stand up and in slow motion grab for the clawed hand before the creature manages to right itself. So Trixie, you may make either a dex check or a fighting brawl check. It's up to you. That is a, or pass, just before. Just a pass, okay. Let's see how it goes with its... Okay, it rolled an 82 on its dodge of 40. So, and it did have a penalty from, it was rolling with disadvantage from Buck kicking it. So as it stumbles, you feel your fingers slowly wrap around its hand. It tugs and pulls and you nearly find yourself falling down onto it in slow motion but you manage to maintain your footing holding its hand above its head it growls and this is when angel steps in front of it and says in a calm voice you may not harm the vessel or her servants. Go ahead, Angel, and make for me either a Cthulhu Mythos check or a hard Persuade check. Ooh, where's my Persuade? I need to know something. Oh, oh I'll just go with Cthulhu Mythos. That is a fail. Fail. Would you like to push it? I will push it. Yeah, that's fail. Fail. It stares, it turns, looks into your eyes with those sunken grey pits. And while it's staring right at Angel, as Trixie holds its arm, restraining it. Vera, Buck, is there anything you'd like to do? Uh, Buck will quickly flip out his uh, carving knife from its little um, leather sheath uh, on his um, on his arm and uh, make for its leg. Yeah, good idea. Vera? I think Vera's going for a photo. Yeah. 
the thing roars. And then it turns away from Angel, ignoring her plea, rips its arm out of out of Trixie's grasp and whirls around to strike Vera and Buck, but Buck is ready. The switchblade flicks open in slow motion and he pushes it forwards. Go ahead, Buck, and make a fighting brawl check for me. And Vera, go ahead and make a photography check. Uh, it's just a pass. Just a pass. Uh, that's a fail, but I'm going to push. Go ahead. Uh, that is absolutely a pass. Absolutely a pass. Okay, That's actually a hard pass. So, he rolled higher, th- he rolled better than you, Buck, but as the tip of your blade cuts his coat, he steps back, deftly dodging your attempt to stab him, moving much faster than you can muster in this strange trance-like state you're in. You struggle to right yourself to pull your blade back and get ready to slash at his hand as it draws close to you. And if it were not for the fact that Vera takes this moment to raise her camera, point it right at the creature's face, and click the flash briefly illuminating the dark carriage you'd have been in a lot of trouble instead the creature flinches raising its left arm to block out its eyes to block the flash and instead of digging its talons into your throat It instead grazes the surface of your skin. You take... Let me see. You take six points of damage, Buck, as it tears the skin on the front of your neck and torso. Good lord. But... As it stumbles from the flash, gripped by pain, seeing red, you lunge forwards with your knife and bury it in what would be this creature's ribcage if it was a human. And that's all you needed to do. The creature roars in pain. And then suddenly, all of the lights in the carriage flicker and turn on. You all nearly, you you all stumble forwards and nearly fall into the aisle as the dreamlike state passes and you're moving at full speed once again. Under the brim of the creature's hat is no longer that horrific, monstrous visage. Instead, you see the disheveled, terrified face of Andrew Keatling and he is screaming, HELP ME! Buck, now that you've dispelled the dream, you clutch your hand to your neck, and the skin is still there. Instead, there's just an itchy patch of red. The six damage you took is halved to three. The nightmare, bizarro version of Andrew Keatling clutches both hands to the sides of his head. Ah, help me, please! He doesn't seem to be going anywhere. And your your knife, your little pen knife, Buck, is still sticking out of his ribcage. Uh, Buck's going to try and reason with him while he reaches for the knife. Yeah, what would you um, like to say anything in particular? Yeah, specifically he's going to ask what it is that he can do. What it is that Andrew knows that yeah. they could possibly do to help him. Wait, 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 what, what, what can you do? What, how can we help? You say, wrapping one hand around the handle of the knife and pulling it free as the 
monster man before you continue screaming, seemingly oblivious to you wrenching a blade out of its flesh. Go ahead for me, please, and make an appearance or a persuade check, Buck. Uh, that is a critical pass. Suddenly, the screaming stops. Keatling's face is neutral. He whips his head around, stares right into your face, Buck. And then he begins to speak. I am the dream of my mistress's lover. Part myself, part Keatling thing, and part something greater than us both. Garcetti is in her true home, obeying the one in the void, dreaming of the future day. And Keatling is in the dark, thinking of kisses, thinking of death. We're gonna get you out for now. This it's the last thing I do, I'm gonna get you out of there. The creature pauses. Its eyes roll wildly and a gurgle emerges from its throat as if it's struggling with itself. A am I am I a a thing dreaming I am a man or a man dreaming that I am a dreaming thing you open your mouth to respond to this cryptic statement and then suddenly the man standing before you shimmers his body fades grows insubstantial reduced to glimmering silver mist and then it flows downwards into the ground seemingly vanishing underneath the floorboards and beyond the coupling of the train carriage you feel an overwhelming presence depart Everything is silent and quiet once again. Just the sound of the train chugging through the black countryside. What just happened? Did we all experience that? Yeah, yeah, I saw it. Saw it. So, now it's becoming increasingly difficult to figure out what's real and what's a dream now. What? Does anyone have any idea of what this means or what what this means for us? Or? I think it means Caitlin's on his last legs. We're gonna have to hurry. Yeah. I can only go as fast as the train's going. <laughs> yeah, Angel's right. Not long to go now. You must have slept longer than you thought, for only about 10 to 15 minutes pass before the first rays of sunlight appear on the horizon outside. And as the train passes through a series of small rural towns, the sky lights up. The clouds blossom into view, and the countryside changes once again to a pleasing shade of green. The carriage jolts as the train begins to slow as it pulls into the station. Muskrat Rapids! Calls the conductor standing at the door at the end of the carriage. Final destination! Final destination. I'm going to take a deep breath and dig big sigh. I suppose this is the start of the end. <laughs> it certainly feels it's like it. He could have just said the line terminates here, but no, he. As he calls out, Final destination, last stop. 
he scans the carriage, looking at all the travellers, and his gaze seems to linger on you, as if he unconsciously knows why you're here and what awaits you. You gather your things, sling your bags over your shoulders, and follow a small group of passengers down the aisle. You step out onto the cobblestone platform outside. The Muskrat Rapids train station is not much to look at. It's a single stone platform on the edge of the town's main street. There's a ramshackle wooden shack at the edge of the platform serving as a station house where you can buy tickets, but no one appears to be manning it at the moment. The people you get off with waste no time. They quickly disembark into taxis and horse-drawn carriages that are waiting for them, leaving you alone on the platform. The conductor finally blows his whistle, steps back into the carriage, And the train engine hisses again. As it begins to roll out of the station. And your chance to turn back. To head back to the safety of Boston. Leaves you behind. So. Into the belly of the beast. As they say. Make your way to the end of the platform, have your ticket stamped in the little machine hanging outside the glass window on the station house shack. And then you step down the set of stone stairs into the main street of the town. Muskrat Rapids, founded in the first years of the 19th century, is a small community that's now growing rapidly due to the ever-expanding Pittsburgh steel industry. Much of the small town, at least that you could see from here, consists of small slapped together houses intended for mill workers and their families. These houses are built haphazardly up and down the steep hills that rise on either side of the Muskrat River that runs parallel to the main street. Even at this early hour of the morning, just after 7.30, the street is already filled with women and children running errands, horse-drawn carriages making their way down the well-trodden dirt road. You don't see any cars, nor do you see any of the menfolk. They're probably all working in the mills in nearby Pittsburgh. As you start to make your way down the main street, you exchange glances with each other and you realise that you don't actually know where the Garcetti estate is. You are simply told that it's somewhere in this town. So you stop for a moment, look around, take stock of your surroundings. A general store and a three-storey boarding house are located on Main Street not too far from the train station. There's also what appears to be a doctor's office, judging by the dull shingle hanging on a leaning post that reads, Anthony Pritchard, MD. You wonder what skills a doctor in a sleepy place like this would actually be capable of. There's a combination town hall and sheriff's office a bit further down the street, And next to it is an old-fashioned Wild West saloon. It's shut. No one's gonna... No one wants to drink at 7.30 in the morning. Even people who live in the arse end of nowhere. So, it's up to you where you'd like to go from here. I suppose at first, he would be fine where this house is. Yeah. 
so any more information. So if you'd like to if you'd like to see if your characters come up with any ideas to follow, you can go ahead and make intelligence checks. These are known as idea checks, and in Call of Cthulhu, whenever you're stuck and you as a player can't think of what to do, you can have your character roll an idea check, and that means that I'll give your character an idea of what to do next. Oh, wonderful. Perfect for my dumb ass. Um, yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, go ahead, roll one, Vera, see what, see what, what you What was get. the roll again? Just intelligence, straight intelligence. Uh, that's a hard pass. So, Vera, you look around and you see the relatively bustling main street, the women all wearing simple attire, running girly morning errands, some of them with their kids tagging along behind them. As a journalist, you know how to approach random people and strike up conversations with them and see if you can get information out of them. Otherwise, you think it might be a good idea to pay a visit to the sheriff's office if you want, if you don't mind the law in this town knowing that you're in town or what you're here for. Otherwise, you could try the general store or the doctor's office and see if anyone in there knows anything about Miss Garcetti. Maybe pick up some supplies that you might need. Uh, Vera's going to relay all of these thoughts to the group and see what they think. Yeah, what do you guys think? Supplies certainly mm. sound like a good idea. We've been saved a few times by our few trips we've made beforehand, so it might be an idea, and if you can figure a way to weasel information without too much suspicion, that would be great. So I'm going to guess you're all in agreement that you probably don't want to head into the sheriff's office and announce your presence in the town. Definitely. I want to look for any, like, dark, sort of wet places or, like, alleyways. Yeah, you sure can. I'd like you to go ahead and make a spot hidden check for me, Angel. Uh, that is a... Fail. But I'm gonna push it. That's also a fail. My dice yeah. are terrible. So you're pretty new in town, and even though this is essentially just a small country town, all of the buildings on the main street are packed up pretty much right up next to each other. There's a couple gaps in between them here and there, but the shadows aren't long enough that they'd be able to hide you from the view of people going past. Buck, what do you think? Um, at this juncture, Buck is going to be just sauntering towards the doctor. Uh, the cut on his throat is smarting pretty bad. Yeah. Alright, so Vera, do you want to follow Buck, or do you want to just pick someone on the street and see what they know? Uh, yeah, I'm following Buck. Alright. And Trixie? Uh, I think I'm going to go for some supplies. Yeah, alright. So Angel, would you like to go with Trixie, or would you like to go with Buck and Vera? Oh, I just leave everyone. Yeah, you just leave, yep. So you, you just start... I just walk off in another direction. Yeah, making your way down the main street, trying to look for somewhere dark and hidden. You don't manage to find anything, but you do give the rest of the group a wide berth while they conduct their investigations. So Buck and Vera, you step towards Anthony Pritchard's humble office and step through the door. A bell rings as your boots clamp down on the rough floorboards. And it's not much of a doctor's office. There's a couple of chairs propped up against the wall next to the door for people to wait. But the rest of it's essentially one open room. There's a bed at the very back and a row of medicine cabinets and 
the doctor seems to be the only person who works here. He doesn't have a secretary. He can't afford luxuries like that when you're a small town doctor. He just looks up from the little wooden table he's sitting at where he's poring over some sort of medical text. His silver rimmed glasses glimmer in the sunlight that floods into the doctor's office as you step in. And he smiles and he says, Well now, let me guess. Industrial accident up the mills or you caught that flu that's going round? I'm running low on i I'm running low on throat syrup, so you might have to do with some salt water and gargling. But I can show you the right amounts. I usually go for something a bit stronger than salt water, personally. Uh, none of the above. Uh, I got a, got a thingy that I need looking at. And Buck just kind of like jabs his finger at his throat. As you step forwards, he, l- he looks up. His gaze rests upon the nasty looking welt on your throat. He frowns and he says, Well, my boy, that looks, that looks like a mighty bad patch of, eczema or something like that some sort of rash you'll be near any poison ivy no, I can't say I have Doc it's the dandest thing just woke up like this he nods he climbs up and taking one last look at the book on the desk he shuffles over to you. He holds out a finger to your neck. He says, uh, do, do you mind? No, please, be my guest. He strokes the welt on your neck with the tip of his finger, and as he does so, pain surges over the surface of your skin, not just in your neck, but like an electric shock that shoots down your entire body. He sees you shudder, withdraws his finger, and he says, Oh, painful, is it? Uh, Buck responds by pulling out his flask and taking a sip. (laughs) Hey, now, you best not drink that out there. Sheriff Jones sees you with that, and you being out from out of town and all, he'll have you locked up in the jailhouse, but it's good for the pain. That it is. Now, see, yep. when you when you first walked in, I thought, I thought, well, here here's some bumbling cowboy. He's been trying to rustle up some critters in the woods or something, and he stumbled into some poison ivy, acting like a damn fool. But now I'm looking at it up close in the light. It don't look like poison ivy at all. It looks like, well. Looks like a burn is what it is. So you wouldn't have, uh, you wouldn't have been out in the sun all day, would you? I'm out in the sun every day. It's never hurt me before. Looks like a mighty bad sunburn. But only thing I don't understand is, well, it ain't summer yet. Yeah, like I said, damnedest thing. Woke up like this. And the fact it only appeared in that one specific spot? Your hands and your hands are fully exposed, back of your neck's exposed, and yet here we are, front of your neck. You got a wicked sunburn there. On a day that's a day that's no hotter than some of the warmest days we've had in winter. Yeah, I can't explain it myself. Is there anything you can do for this? This is unbelievably painful. And, um, uh, Buck kind of makes eyes to, um, to Trixie, uh, and eyes to, um, the books, uh, books on his desk. Ah, yeah, Vera, would you like to try and snap a photo as the doctor goes to get some medicine? Yes. Yes, I would. Well, now, I've got... Sorry, not Trixie. Yeah, (laughs) sorry. Well, now, I've got... I've got some sunburn ointment. Uh, I'm not sure how well it'll do, but it might stop the discomfort. Anything. All right, 
you just wait there, he says. He turns around, he shuffles across the room and starts looking through the metal medicine cabinet, rifling through bottles and pill boxes, and he's got his back turned to the both of you. Go ahead, Vera, make a photography check. Yeah, I passed. Uh, Buck, Buck leans in and says, uh, I think I think it's under G. <laughs> <laughs> ah, G. Oh, right, yeah, G. G for... No, no. No, no, you're thinking of... You're thinking of that thing for, uh... For when you got problems down there. Oh, here it is. As Vera... <laughs> Vera shuffles towards the desk, holds her camera up, fixes the medical text in the viewfinder, and... <laughs> takes a photo. In the brief moment you get to glimpse it, before you have to put your camera away, Vera. You determine that the book is open on a page describing sleep ailments. Insomnia on one page, but night terrors on the next page, along with a list of various medicines that could be prescribed for these conditions. Here you are, my boy, says the doctor as he presses a tube of some viscous white substance into your hand. Thanks, Doc. Now that'll yeah, be uh, five dollars. Buck forgot entirely that it was going to cost him money and regrettably fumbles through his pockets for whatever he yeah. has. What's your credit rating, Buck? Uh, his credit rating is... Uh, good question. His credit rating is 40. Yeah, you've definitely got five dollars. You reluctantly reach into your pocket and pull out some dollar bills and hand them to him. And he says, Well, now that I've got what's good for what ails you, I don't recognize you. It's clear you're from out of town and, well, only people that come in from out of town are here because they're looking to get work up at one of the steel mills, but, uh, you and the pretty young thing over there don't quite look like you're the top. If you don't mind me asking, what brings you to our neck of the woods? Uh, Buck exchanges a glance quickly with um, Vera and then Honeymoon. back to the doctor. Honeymoon. Honeymoon. <laughs> Vera, go ahead and make a fast talk check. <laughs> sure. Um, that's a hard pass. Honeymoon. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're nearly wed. Well, congratulations, says the old man. He looks over at Buck and he winks and he says, Ah, oh, you, you got a mighty fine bride there if I do say so myself. Well, look, you picked a wonderful place to have a honeymoon. It's nice and quiet out here. There's lots of trails in the woods. You can go hiking up in the mountains, see if you can see some local critters and... As long as you stay away from the poison ivy and... Oh. If you do go hiking... You might come across, uh... This old manor house. Up near the seaside. A uh, couple miles out of town, up to the north... Northeast. If you see that place... Just turn around. Go back the other way. Uh... Garcetti family's been in these parts for quite some time, but they are not especially welcoming to visitors. Well, that'd spoil our honeymoon, wouldn't it? <laughs> sure yeah. would. You don't want to be cavorting around with them. That pretty young Josephine, the daughter, she, she was always a strange one. You could tell by looking at her, she was just plain wicked. She lit out of here after finishing high school, and after fooling around with just about all the men folk in town. She caused a bit of trouble with some of the wilder local boys when she got to be a young woman. Most folks around here are glad she went off to Boston or whatever, wherever it was that she went. So, uh, you best just stay away from, uh, stay away from that part of town entirely. Stick to the trails on the west side. Those are the ones that I usually recommend for tourists. Thank you. 
Well now, anything else? If you're heading, if you're deciding to go hiking, I might recommend some insoles for your feet. Uh, Doris down the general store should have them. That's mighty thoughtful. I don't see why more people don't come here for their honeymoons. <laughs> he holds out his hand and you see some age spots on his wrinkled, worked skin. And he says, well, how, I wish I saw more people coming to town looking for something more than just making money out the mills. <laughs> I'm a... I'm Dr. Pritchard, by the way. Pleasure to meet you. Yeah, likewise, Doc. And you too, ma'am, he says to Vera, doing a little bow. Uh, Vera returns as such and gives him a smile. Well, now, you enjoy your honeymoon, and remember, you be careful on those hiking trails. Don't go near the poison ivy. Don't eat any of the plants, and uh, if you get snake bit... You just wrap it up in some clothing or something, and you get back here as quick, smart as you can. I'll fix you up. Well, do. Um, and as they leave, Vera sort of hooks their arm around um, Buck. Yeah, doing the best show of playing the newlywed couple. The doctor makes his way back to the desk, and you hear the chair rattle as he sinks back into it. The bell rings as you open the door once again, and then you step out into the bustling main street. That was pretty easy, you think. Now you know where the Gar City estate is. We cross to... We cross to Trixie. Trixie, you pass the three-story boarding house and step into the general store. The window that faces the street is adorned with mannequins wearing hats and frocks that are at least a couple years out of fashion. You push open the door and the bell rings within the recesses of the dark, dusty store. It's dimly lit inside, but after a few seconds your eyes adjust and you see yourself standing in front of rows upon rows of general goods canned foods, non-perishables, hiking equipment, guns and ammunition. Beyond them, leaning over a wooden counter is a severe-faced old woman. She eyes you sternly as you begin to browse the store. Looking for anything, dear? Good afternoon, ma'am. Pleasure to meet you. A man. Well, you're looking to hark on the trails, are you? Yes, well, I'm meeting my dear nephew out here, and he, he was wanting me to teach him how to live off the land and do a bit of camping, so I was wondering if you could give me any tips or any resources that could help me around these, these hiking trails around here. Or... Nephew, she says. Oh, strange. I didn't know there were any tops that like to live off the land around here. Everyone makes their living in the mills. But hell, mm -hmm. I won't question someone who's come to town to enjoy nature. Yes, well, we're from Boston, you see, and we thought, what better a place to learn than somewhere we have no idea where we are. Boston? Well, you picked a fine place, I'll say that much. Used to be a lot less round these parts. It's grown over the last years, but nature's still here. She reaches under the counter and she pulls out a folded map and she says, This is a map of the surrounding area. That'll get you where you need to go. But if you're going hiking, might I suggest a lantern and a rope and a first aid kit, I would not recommend going out with at least those. Sounds like quite the sensible essentials. Yes, yeah, they sound quite good. How much for those? She starts bashing the keys on the old-fashioned cash register in front of her and it goes BADING! And she says, oh, uh, that'll be uh, fifteen dollars, young lady. Uh, What's your credit rating, Trixie? 30. 
yeah, you've got more than enough. There's about $20 in your purse, so you hand over 15 of that. And she quickly slides it into the drawer and bags up the rope and the map and the first aid kit in a paper bag. And she says, Now, uh, you said you was from Boston, didn't you? That's correct. We got a local girl, uh, Josephine. She went up to Boston to study. Wouldn't have heard of her by any chance, would you? I might say, I actually work for the Boston Museum and I believe we had a few donations from her recently. Was she around here for long? Well, that's a mighty fine coincidence, she says. Listen, if you know how to get in touch with Josephine, please pass on a message. Her mother, Mrs. Garcetti, ain't, ain't been seen in town for almost a month now, stranger. People are getting worried. We was thinking Josephine ought to know that her mother is, uh, seems to have gone missing. Oh my, that is terrible news. Well, be sure to keep that in mind and next time I'm in Boston, I'll be sure to go around and see if I can perhaps meet her. She sounds like an interesting lass, that's for sure. You enjoy your time with your nephew, young lady, and if you need any camping supplies, I'm open until seven every night. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, one more question. There wouldn't happen to be any critters or animals we should be preparing to face off without there. No bears or anything we need a weapon for? She chuckles. <laughs> oh dear. Well... Plenty of bears in these parts, wolves too, and plenty venomous snakes and other critters. Look, I, I would suggest if you see a nasty critter, you just leave them alone. They won't do anything unless you scare them, but look, uh, normally I'm supposed to wait for a background check from the sheriff, but it would buy you a little bit of peace of mind to buy a firearm, I'd be willing to sell it to you. Oh, thank you. That'd be much appreciated. Yes, I always do try to say, if you don't bother the wildlife, they won't bother you, but you never know what will be extra hungry at night. She hobbles over to a nearby rack and lifts a hunting rifle off it. She lays it down on the counter along with a box of ammunition. She says, eh, this one's for hunting, but it'll be more than enough to scare away a nasty critter. Might save your life. Now, you know how to shoot one, I presume? Dabbled in a bit of firearms. Yes, my, my nephew should have a better idea. Good, good. Well, well I'll, skilled, right? I'll let you have this one for five dollars with the box of bullets. But just remember, you brought it from home. You didn't get it from me. You hear? Understood, my lips are sealed. Thank you so much. You handed the last Very bit of money in your wallet and then sling the hunting rifle over your shoulder, pick up the bag of goods and thank her for her time, stepping out into the main street just in time to see Angel returning from one side, looking disappointed after not being able to find a dark alleyway to skulk in. And Buck and Vera coming from the other side, arm in arm, as if they're a married couple living up their honeymoon. Did I miss something? You two look like you had an eventful morning. <laughs> Yeah, Vera sort of gives a gives a wink, and uh, she kisses Buck on the cheek. Yeah, we're newlyweds, apparently. <laughs> apparently. Give a bit of chuckle. Well, I can't see. I didn't see that coming. <laughs> and if anyone asks, I'm here to see my nephew. And yeah, yeah. As Trixie says this. You all notice the rather 
impressive looking hunting rifle that's hanging over her shoulder. Buck, it's almost the same caliber as your own and by the looks of it, brand new. It's never been fired before. See, so you got yourself a piece. You uh, feel comfortable holding something like that? Bit of practice, but anything for a bit of peace of mind, rather than going in unprepared. I can give you a few pointers if you want. Uh, not yeah. not in town, though, of course. <laughs> of course. Oh, obviously not. <laughs> that would be appreciated. I'm I know my way around roughly, but I don't want to shoot yeah, the wrong thing. <laughs> Trixie has a map, and using what you were told by the doctor, you're able to pinpoint exactly where the Garcetti estate would be on the map. And with all the trails marked on the map, it shouldn't be a problem to get there. So, if you guys think you're ready to step oh, into the I've Valley been... of the Beast... And I've been given a message for our dear Josephine. The... The shop owner said that her mother's been missing for quite a while. Yeah. <laughs> Why have I got the feeling that's not going to be news to her at all? So either it's going to be easier getting in, or we've got some more trouble on our hands. Yeah. Well. It adds to the sense of foreboding that now, even in broad daylight in this bustling street, starting to build within you once again. Is there anything else you'd like to do before you head off? How did you go, Angel? Where did you run off to? Uh, went for a walk, you know, just I'm looking for a dark place to sit. <laughs> Angel doesn't mention all of the strange glances she got from passers-by who were completely weirded out by her assortment of jewellery that she always wears. Her talismans jingling like keys as she walked past. Well, if you do need some time alone, feel free to scout ahead. We could sort out these supplies while we're at it. Or if you want to read the map... Get a gauge of where we're going. Yeah. And try and sort of shoo her out the way so she can chat to Buck and Vera. I just say, like, there's a map? Fuck, I could have used that at all, yeah. <laughs> well, um. I mean, I guess I could read and walk away. Actually, speaking of reading, uh, Vera, what did you, what did you see in the uh, doctor's notes? Yeah, he's, uh,. He's preoccupied with dreams as well. Sounds like an <laughs> epidemic around here. What are you doing on my head? <laughs> so, do you feel ready? Is Angel hanging around us at the moment? Yeah, Angel's Angel's snatched the the map out of your hand and she's just reading it and she's already like half a half a block ahead of you just following the following the trail that you've marked out on the map. While we're speaking of dreams, um, did either of you, besides from the the encounter we had this morning, did either of you have a dream last night? Sure didn't. Haven't been having them lately at all, actually. Oh, really? See, interesting. I've got a theory, because in a lot of these faiths and stories like these, they're really connected to dreams, so I have a theory that maybe the one who does not believe could be quite literally someone who doesn't believe, which would be hard for us because we've all seen all this crazy shit, or it could mean someone who doesn't have dreams. Although I'm not sure if it's, if that is the case, or if it's someone who has had to have never dreamt at all in their lives or recently, but... So I was chalking it all up to uh, the drinking I've been doing lately. It turns out that that's what we needed. I'm gonna never stop. Yeah, it may have Ever. something to do with the drinking. <laughs> Who would have thought drinking could have? Usually the thing with drinking is you just don't remember the dreams, but... 
if this is what ends up saving your life. So, <laughs> buckle stuck up on whiskey forever. Yeah, forever. <laughs> End prohibition <laughs> himself. <laughs> so as you catch up with Angel and let her lead you down the street toward, oh, towards the end of the main street and on to one of the dirt roads that leads up into the hills and through the ramshackle worker housing. I'd like everyone to make spot hidden checks for me, please. Mm. Uh, I'm going to push it. Oh, that's a fail. Like, Ooh. 99. Yep. Uh, yeah, that's a critical. Critical, yeah. Oh. Vera, Vera, you've got reason to keep your eye out, given what you've been through in the short time you've known this group. And so you're the first to notice, Vera, as you trudge mm -hmm. along the dirt trail and the businesses give way to corrugated iron shacks and cheap looking shotgun homes you notice a strange duo mingling in the crowds both of them dressed in pinstriped suits overcoats and fedoras they stand out like sore thumbs among the semi-rural blue-collar locals. You catch them staring at you, and then when they realise you've eyeballed them, they quickly look away, doing their best show of reading a nearby street directory. I'm assuming Vera points this out. Yes, yes, sorry, she does. Yeah. Uh, does Buck potentially recognize them from the, um, uh, the dock worker bar? Just make an education Speaking check easy. for me, please, Buck. Um, that is a, uh, critical success. Critical success. Yeah, Buck, the cut of their suits is almost identical to some of Zeke's goons that were hanging around in the speakeasy. Uh, it looks like Zeke didn't trust us to uh, carry this all out ourselves. Uh, it's like he sent some goons or... I don't even know what they are. Whatever they are, they're following us. Yeah, at the very least he's sent some of his men to keep an eye on you. Do you, do you call out to them or engage with them in any way or do you just continue on? Hmm. Can I do a check of any sort to sort of gauge whether that would be a good idea? <laughs> um, yeah, you can make a psychology check, but I think Angel Angel's good at this as well, even if you fail. No, push that. No, fail. So you nudge Angel, and you turn towards Angel and you say, What's your reading on these guys? Um, that is a hard success. Hard success. So, Angel, as you walk past these men, you stare at them for a few seconds and. They don't appear to mean any harm, but it's very clear from the way they keep looking up, checking to see if you're looking back and then turning away, trying their very best to not be noticed in the crowd, that at the very least they're watching you. It doesn't seem like they mean to hurt you. They're probably... Probably telling their boss that you've arrived in town and that you're heading towards Garcetti's estate. But it's unsettling just the same to know that he has men in town watching you. Yeah, 
Uh, Buck's had just enough to drink today. He's gonna go wander down and uh, slap him on the back. <laughs> yep. So you usher the others to keep. You usher the others to keep going, and then you make your way across the street into the crowd and slap one of the pinstriped men on his back. He jumps. Ah! He turns around. His buddy following suit. And then they see you and they narrow their eyes and... The man says, So you eyeballed us, did you? Yeah, I'm thinking of getting one of those suits for myself after this is over. Now, hey, look. Says the gangster, raising his hands. We don't mean you no harm, but we're under orders by the boss to make sure you get into town and to make sure you don't uh, abscond with the stone after you got it, right? Yeah, we ain't going nowhere, boys. We ain't gonna, we ain't here to help you and we ain't gonna get involved with that Garcetti broad. We're just gonna... Go put in a call back to Boston, say you've made it to town, and, well, we'll meet up with you after you're done, and, uh, see if we can, uh, discuss the handing over of the goods, you understand? Yeah, loud and clear. So, uh, what's the going rate for a stone nowadays, anyway? Well, I understand the boss already made you an offer, but... The other man nudges him with his elbow, and he says, Yeah, yeah, okay, Chucky, I'm getting there. Uh, look, uh, Chucky's been given some extra cash just in case we needed to grease the wheels, and he leans in so that any passers-by don't overhear what he's saying. If you come straight to us after you get the stone back from Garcetti, we are authorized to give you an extra 500 dough right out of pocket before you even get back to Boston. And, and, and That's a very generous offer. And, and, and we'll do it too. You, you, can, you can trust our word. You can, you can trust that Chucky the Rat and Big Al have got your back. Best interests at heart. Now, if I hadn't seen all sorts of strange things lately, I wouldn't believe that. But I honestly do. You're about the straightest faces I've seen all year. Well, hey, look, uh, we were just told we was going to be paid good cash to hop on a train, go uh, rest up, have a vacation in some lovely little town for a couple of days, and make a phone call when uh, a group of people matching a certain description showed up. Uh, we ain't complaining, we ain't trying to stiff you in any way. As far as we're concerned, we got a great gig going. So how's about you go make that call, huh? Can do, says the one calling himself Chucky the Rat. Oh, and, uh, you know, since you eyeballed us and all, I suppose we should tell you the real reason why the boss, uh, is paying you to go, uh, deal with the Garcetti broad. Let me guess. You can't tear out a train, right? Well, you know, yeah, come to think of it, uh, he said a train wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't be agreeable to him. Said he had other means of travel, but, uh, no, uh, see, the thing is, and, well, look, I don't know how seriously you take this stuff, but the boss takes it seriously, and, uh, well, Garcetti's put up these, uh, like these magical totems around her property, right? And... Look, I don't believe in the mumbo-jumbo, but every time, every time Chucky and I have set foot on her property, we just get this awful feeling, and uh, we, we just feel compelled to turn around and leave, and the boss said she's probably knowing that he's sending goons after her to get the stone back, so uh, she's probably put up some sort of magical warding to keep uh, the boss and his men out. 
Hey, I don't argue, I just know I'm being paid to uh, go along with it. Now, this uh, Mumbo Jumbo, is it uh, easily identifiable? Well, yeah, you know, like, uh, writing, glowing, anything like that? Well, you should see him. There's a big... There's a big hedge around the property. And if you look in the hedge, you can find them. Uh, these strange totems. Uh, they look like something out of one of those pulp novels. You, 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 you won't mistake them when you see them. Now, uh, Chucky said maybe we should just, you know, kick them over. But... I don't know. Uh, it's just something to call me superstitious, but I got a bad feeling that y messing around with one of them's gonna bring bad luck, you know? Yeah, I can tell you, uh, this entire thing is gonna be a whole run of bad luck for you. Uh, word to the wise, once this is done, I highly suggest you skip town. Your boss, uh... Don't want to drop too much information, but, uh, yeah, you don't want to see him when the lights go out. The one called Big Al shrugs. He says, hey, when our business is done, we got the stone, we'll skip town. Uh, look, we'll, we'll be staying at the boarding house, but, uh, I'm sure we'll see you all again very soon. Yeah, with any luck, uh, I'll see you soon, too. The man tips his fedora to you. Trying his very best to appear friendly, and then you turn around, and you catch up with the others, and you fill them in on the conversation that you just had. I never thought it was going to be an easy shot to get in, but at least I know what we're up against now. If only we could have uh, uh, the rat come in and uh, kick over these totems for us. It would make this a lot easier, instead of... Uh, Rustling around in the trees and whatever, looking for something that we don't know what it looks like. Oh, got my own foot. <laughs> so, after about an hour of walking, following Angel as she leads you down the routes marked on the map, you find yourselves on a narrow, seldom used road, screened on both sides by a dense growth of brush, hedges, and trees. This tall, unkempt fence of foliage marks the perimeter around the Garcetti house. Now normally, you'd be rolling spot hidden with disadvantage here, but Buck, you've been specifically told that there's something to hide here, so you may all go ahead and roll me spot hidden checks just normally, please. Use a... Push that. Pushing that. Ah, that's man. Uh, that is a critical success for Buck. Critical success. Five on the dot. Five on the dot. Okay. So Trixie's... Uh, Angel's the only one who doesn't see. But the rest of you will point it out soon enough. You take only a few steps beyond the hedges when you see it, Buck points it out, and right there, you see the presence of one of the totems hidden in the hedges, carefully camouflaged with leaves and vines. It seems to be driven deep into the ground, as if one, the same way one would beat a tent peg into the dirt. And the totem, which vaguely resembles a small humanoid figure is between one and two feet in height. It's composed of carefully gnawed and shaped bones. You hope they're animal bones. They're all bound together with various odd materials, including sinew, old string, knotted rags, what appear to be dried intestines and an unidentifiable adhesive substance that gives off a nauseating stench stronger the closer you get to the totem as you see the as you see this totem I'd like everyone to make a sand check for me please I uh, pass 
for once. Uh, big fail. Pass. So for a pass, it's a send loss of zero, and for a fail, just a send loss of one. Aside from the striking appearance of this totem, there doesn't appear to be anything inherently dangerous about it. The bad feeling that the mobsters described doesn't register with you. And Angel, with your knowledge of the occult, you're quite confident that this totem is one of four. One placed on each corner of the estate to cover each of the four cardinal directions. It's a ward specifically against Zeke Crater and his men, but apparently not against you. You also know that this type of spell only works when all four totems are undisturbed, and all you'd have to do to disrupt it would be to destroy this one here that you found. It's up to you, Angel, if you'd like to share this with the others, though. Angel just shakes her head, looks at the others, and she says, Hmm, perhaps it's best we don't meddle in things we do not understand. And flashes a mischievous grin. Um, Trixie, you also have, you have a cult as well, I believe? Yep, I was uh, just about to ask. Do yeah, that. you can. So Angel knows this automatically because she's, you know, really into spells. But you can roll your occult to see if you come up with the same knowledge. Especially seeing as Angel's keeping quiet, it's going to be more reason to check on that. That is a seventeen. Yeah. So you see Angel smile as if she recognizes these totems, and you stare at the one in front of you and you come to pretty much the same conclusion as her. It's obviously some sort of warding spell. It doesn't appear to be targeting you specifically, so it may be fine for you to press on and leave this totem as is, but if you'd like to be sure, you could destroy this one and that would render the whole spell useless. What do you all think? Seeing as she's expecting Zeke, it might be worth leaving him up so she thinks that the ground is still protected if she's not expecting us to come in? Or do you want to be on the safe side and get rid of one of these? It's sort of going to be a mind game of trying to figure out if she's ex what she would expect if she's expecting only Zeke or if she would know he would send someone after her. And how do you do with mind games, Trixie? Fairly average, probably not as well as Angel, but <laughs> seems like she's got her mind on other things at the moment. Mm, presently accounted for. Uh... Can I do a do 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 do? Oh, not good with psychology. I ask because it's not really my forte. You're good at getting information out of people, but keeping secrets of your own—that's. Not really something you've been trained to do. I'm a journalist, not a spy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I might just try a psychology check and... Yeah, go ahead. Zero, zero. Nope, 91, that's a fail. Um, if Vera likes, she can make a psychology check and you'd get an idea of perhaps how Garcetti might react in either situation. Uh, well... That's the worst possible luck imaginable. Uh, I got a 99, pushed it, got a 98. 98, yeah. So, normally you're good at reading people, Vera, but you're dealing with someone who serves an unknowable eldritch god here. Your best guess is that if you leave the totems as is, she might think she's protected and not expect to see you. On the other hand, if you do destroy the totem, the fact that someone has so easily disrupted her magical protections might be enough to make her more willing to surrender to you. With that what you will, I, I, I 
I don't know, really. How about we leave him? Kick him down on the way out. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. <laughs> so, you press on, continuing up the road, and... Soon, the hedges give way. They open up into the front yard of the estate. The gardens and the lawns are completely overrun. It's hard to tell what's meant to be a garden and what's meant to be simple yawn. It's just a field of foliage tangled together that would easily come up to your waist even higher if you were to step off the trodden dirt driveway that leads directly to the house. The house itself is suffering from long years of neglect. It's greying under a peeling coat of paint. The windows don't to be bo don't appear to be boarded up, but there's a thick layer of dust on each of the window panes, coating the glass and making it all but impossible to see through the other side. There's a couple stairs leading up onto a half-collapsed front patio, and there's two grand oak doors, the front entrance, the only part of this estate that still commands any sort of respect. So, front door, we'll find another way in. Uh, Buck's gonna look around for like a dilapidated window he could peer through first. Yeah. Yeah, I think it'd be worth scouting around. Alright. I'd like Buck to go ahead for me and make a spot hidden check. Uh, that is a 20, so that is a regular pass. So, most of the windows on the ground floor are way too way too dusty to see through, but as you step off the drive and start trudging through the thick foliage, heading around one of the corners of the house, you come to the back and there's a single window here next to a back door and it looks like someone has very recently brushed away some of the dust on the glass the first thing you try is to lift the window up to open it, but of course it's locked. However, you're still able to peer through this little gap that's been wiped away, and on the other side you see what appears to be a dilapidated kitchen. You can just make out the shape of the counters and a non-functioning refrigerator. Beyond that, there's an open doorway leading out into some sort of foyer and you can see a staircase leading up to the second floor and concerningly right in front of the front door what appears to be a man's hat that's been crumpled underfoot. Does the hat look familiar? Perhaps like a, a, a certain Keating's hat? Yes, it does indeed look like the type of hat that Andrew Keatling would wear. It's it's not a, it's not the sort of, you know, cheap hat you'd expect to find in a rural town. It looks like somebody's hat that they would put on for a night out socialising. Uh, Buck's going to groan and um, give the back door a bit of a twist and see if it'll uh, yep. come easily. So what is your spot hidden score, Buck? Uh, 25. 25. So Buck, as you grab, as you reach for the door handle of the back door, you feel a sharp stinging pain and pull back your hand. Ah! And then you look and see that someone has lined the back of the door handle, and indeed, the s entire side of the back door with a series of bent, rusty nails. 
and you take one point of damage. Oh. I don't suppose the um, sunburn lotion had helped that. Unfortunately <laughs> not. You've got a little bit of blood from your palm. You just lick it off and rub it together with your other palm and hope that it'll clear up. But now that you know it's there, being more careful this time, you reach out, grab the doorknob and try to turn it. But you realise that whoever's booby-trapped it with nails seems to have boarded it shut on the other side. If you do want to get through the back door, you'll have to force it open and it'll probably be loud. Can I see through the window uh, anything about the front door that would imply that it's booby trapped in some the way? Front like door anything apart appears from the, to be, the front door appears to be perfectly safe. You get the feeling that Garcetti isn't necessarily trying to stop you from getting into her house. She just wants to make sure there's only one entrance you can use. Uh, Buck's going to make a mental note of that, and when they enter, he's going to open that rear window. Yeah, very well. So you return, once again trudging through the thick foliage, returning to the others standing in front of the front patio, and you tell them what you've seen. It's at this point when, Trixie, you notice the trail of blood aching through Buck's fingers and see the cut on his palm. The skin around it is already starting to turn a deep red and it occurs to you that if that's not treated very soon, he might pick up an infection. Oof. A bit nasty there, isn't it? Did you want to handle that? Yeah, in a matter of speaking. Uh, and he takes his uh, other hand and uh, takes a swig of his whiskey. So you've got the first aid kit with you. So whoever would like to conduct first aid, you get a temporary plus 20% to your skill for having a fully stocked first aid kit. Oh, nice. So Buck's already low on health. It's probably a good time to do it. 55 with that out of 20, that is a pass. 20 pass, yeah. So Trixie takes a moment to treat the wound. She pours some alcohol into it. It stings and Buck winces. And then she slaps a bandage, wrapping it around your hand. There's no danger of infection now and you recover that one hit point. You're no longer in danger of succumbing to the infection at a critical moment. That would have been, um... <laughs> the most... What a way to go! What a way, way to go. go, yeah. <laughs> Tetanus. <laughs> so... <laughs> according to the Buck's... Human of all. According to Buck's observations, the only way in is the front door. Are you game enough? Uh, we already did a spot hidden to see if there was any other ways yeah. in. Uh, you Unless you want to force there. the back door open and make a lot of noise. No, front door it is. Alright, who's going to open it? It's Angel, it's first and in. <laughs> yeah. I guess, yeah, Angel just rushes forwards up the stairs and grabs the door. And as Angel pushes it open, the door makes a loud shuddering and creaking sound. <coughs> As the but two wars... Seems we've got a distraction. Yep. Maybe you keep an eye out and you might be able to... Well, even though it's going to be loud, you might be able to sneak in if she causes enough commotion up the front here. Yeah. If uh, Josephine is inside. Angels just run right in and on the other side of the door you could see... Uh, a dimly lit entrance hall. Um, the inside of the house is covered in a thick layer of dust and... The wallpapers are starting to fade and peel off in places. And standing in the middle of the foyer, Angel calls out, Josephine, we're here for you! And there's no response. I'm gonna whisper over to Buck and Vera. It's just. 
stick behind and see how this plays out. You don't dare hope that maybe, maybe you've got incredibly lucky and she's not home. Either Bear that. just raises her camera. Yeah. <laughs> readies it. And I suppose Buck and Trixie are raising your rifles as you step over the threshold. Oh, yeah. 100%. Yeah. So the floorboards creak as you step over the threshold, catching up with Angel, as Angel's looking around, trying to find any sign of something. Who knows what she's looking for? So... From the foyer, there are two doors, one on the left that appears to lead into a living room, and one on the right that leads into a quiet, dark dining room, and presumably, Buck, this is what leads into the kitchen and the back door. The only other place you can go is up to the second floor. Uh, yeah, Buck's gonna head over to the window, um, and... Pat Angel on the back as he walks past. Yep. It's not going to work out for you. Keep it down. So, Buck, you make your way through the dining room. It contains a fine wooden table, six wooden chairs with scrolled arms. A single place on the table has been cleared and kept very clean. The rest of the tablecloth is utterly filthy. As you move beyond it and step into the kitchen... A horrible stench fills your nose. The kitchen is masked by a layer of recent filth, including spilled food, half-empty cans of vegetables, and piles of unwashed dishes. Screwing your face Ugh. up in disgust, you creep over this filth and make your way to the window just above one of the counters. Unsnip the latch. And lift it open, and the whole house seems to shudder as you lift this window up. And as you lift the window up and cause seemingly the entire house to groan, I'd like everyone to make a listen check, please. Oh, both fail. Okay, Vera. Um, that's a pass for me. A pass for Buck. That's a pass. A pass for me. So Buck and Vera, Angel does not hear this, as Angel seems to be preoccupied as she's rapidly searching the house, moving through the downstairs rooms at a brisk pace, calling out Josephine's name over and over. Buck and Vera... You suddenly hear from somewhere upstairs the sound of something scraping against wood and then mm, 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 someone trying to call for help. Uh, Buck's going to dash back into the room and announce that um, he's pretty sure Andrew's upstairs. Yeah, and make Vera, the you've, you've heard it too, Vera. Yeah, I'm following. So, at, at Trixie, as you see Vera and Buck hurrying towards the staircase, you didn't hear the sound of Andrew Keatling. Do you follow follow them, sure in what they've heard, or do you conduct your own search? I'm going to um, keep an eye on Angel and just stand up on the staircase, keeping an ear on both sides. Yep. And Angel... As you see them run upstairs, do you follow? It's not. Nope. All right, Angel's continuing to search downstairs. And Trixie, you're not sure what Angel's looking for. So you stand at the base of the stairs and just follow her, watch her. So I would like Angel to please go ahead and make a spot hidden check for me. Would you like to push it, Angel? Fail. Great. 
crime. Fail. All right. So you don't find... You find what you're looking for, but you miss what might be a very important sign. So, Trixie, you follow Angel through the downstairs living room. The living room's just like the rest of the house, a layer of dust, coats, everything. The house is nicely furnished, but it's obviously been abandoned for quite some time. Just... Wasn't alone. I said the mother was away. Yeah, the mother was away. Just beyond the just beyond the living room, there's a little narrow hallway that leads to the very back of the house. And at the end of it, there's a single wooden door. If you know your layout of houses of this kind of build, Trixie and Angel, it occurs to you that this door at the end of the hallway is probably the storage room or the pantry. There's probably a door on the other side of it that leads out into the kitchen. But it's strange that it's tucked away in this dark corner of the house, completely out of the way, and... You see... Even though the hallway itself is dark, dusty, shadowy, you see a bright line of light spilling out from under the door. And Angel, as you approach it, you hear a voice whispering in your ear. Yes, yes, come find me. Come to me, vessel. Angel, do you open the door? Angel says she's going to follow the voice and open the door. So Trixie, you see Angel creep ahead of you towards the door towards where the pantry should be. She grabs the door handle and slowly turns it. And the door creaks open as bright sunlight fills the tiny narrow corridor and Angel steps beyond the threshold. Here's a question for you, Trixie. Do you follow? I will... Hang in the shadows and see how it plays out. Alright. So you're not going to enter the room, you're just going to stand in the hallway and watch and see what happens? It's probably Yeah, I'm just going to keep an ear out and see if so, what Angel does. So Angel, the first thing you feel is a flicker of disappointment as you step beyond the threshold and enter what seems to be a completely vacant room. It's filled with bright light, and there's no window, and no light fixture. So the first thing that strikes you is puzzlement at where this light is coming from. And then, as you think of turning to leave the room, the ceiling above you begins to silently quiver and to buckle in a wholly unnatural fashion, as if it's a piece of fabric blowing in the wind. So Angel says, hmm, interesting. She steps forwards, stands in the light, and turns her gaze up at the wavering ceiling. You witness a mind-wrenching sight. Angel. The apparently solid ceiling splits open to reveal a field of shifting colours beyond, within which a single tiny point can be seen moving closer and closer to you. Flickering lavender 
and green witch fire dances upon the surface of this moving thing, obscuring its nature and its shape. Angel, go ahead and make a sand check for me. Fail. There's something, some instinctual response within you, Angel, that tells you to look away, look away immediately and leave the room, but you're transfixed by what you see above you. You stand dumbfounded, unable to move, and you watch the slow advance of your god, the thing hanging in the void. It approaches closer and closer and closer. The field of colours above stretches out in all directions, enfolding you until you until they appear to be reality itself. The room you are standing in is gone. Angel, you are now standing on the bare rocky summit of a mountain of colour, dimly swirling below a huddled, noisy shadows, above chaos and the thing beyond. He arrives. Hanging above you is a vaguely humanoid shape, dark in colour, but wrapped in light. At first, seems to you, Angel, to be nothing more than a simple lifeless mass of stone and crystal. Then you blink and it changes. It takes the form of a desiccated, mummified body. Then you blink again and it takes its most maddening form. A blending, twisting cacophony of mewling faces, barely inches from your eyes. I have a picture in our bear rodeo that attempts to approximate what you see. Oh, Jesus. Oh, jeez. <laughs> you look up into him, into it, angel, and you say, my body is yours. Yogsathoth, use it as you please, for I am your vessel. The thing makes no response. You hear no voice. It simply shudders. And now, for losing your sand check earlier, you lose 1d100 sand. Oh, jeez. Roll a two. <laughs> Seven sun. Well, that's still five or more. So you need to make an intelligence check to see if you comprehend what is happening. Trixie hearing any of this? Trixie is not. In fact, Trixie, you can't even see Angel anymore. All you can see is this brilliant light spilling forth pass. Angel, you've passed your intelligence check. You comprehend. You go temporarily insane, and as this thing descends towards you, you step forwards, a great smile on your face. You hold out your arms to embrace it, and it whispers in your mind, You have fulfilled your destiny, the vessel, the sacrifice. Trixie, you suddenly hear from beyond the threshold the loudest, most heart-wrenching scream. Angel's voice piercing dimensions, screaming in abject shock and terror as she succumbs to a fate worse than death. 
the brilliant light flickers, and then the door slams shut. Bang! Angel is no more. At least for now. A thin <laughs> bar of light under the crack of the door flickers and then it fades away. Trixie, do you Run dare the open the door to see what's on the other side? Uh, at first she's going to start banging on it and calling out Angel, see if she can get any response of any kind. You receive no response whatsoever. One minute, I'm going to make a throw for myself to make a decision. <laughs> <laughs> um, she's going to run upstairs and let the others know. Yeah. You, what's going on. you reach for the door handle, but then something tells you not to, even though the strange light is gone. And for all you know, it's just a normal pantry on the other side. You shudder. You turn and run as fast as you can. To rejoin the others. Buck and Vera. You rush up the stairs and begin to search the second floor of the house. There are four doors. Buck kicks the closest one, the one on his immediate right down. And the door swings open to reveal a dusty bathroom. The tiles cracked and warped. Then, brandishing his gun, he kicks down the next one, revealing a bedroom on the other side. This is the only room in the house that shows much sign of upkeep. The bed appears to be slept in and has been left unmade. There are fresh apples in a paper bag on the floor. The closet Hanging open contains attractive and stylish women's clothing, but aside from that, the room is empty. So you move on to the next one, kicking the door down. You emerge into an unoccupied and absolutely filthy guest bedroom that leads leaves one more door, and I'll get to you in a moment, Topsy. Don't worry, that will come in that may come into play. You have one more door, presumably to a third master bedroom. And as you stand in front of it, Vera and Buck, side by side, you're about to move to open it when suddenly you hear a terrible, terrible scream from downstairs. A woman's scream. The scream of a woman meeting a face, meeting a fate worse than death and then you see Trixie rushing up the stairs rushing towards you a look of utter shock and terror on her pale face oh my god happened, let me guess but I don't think it's good oh my god uh, alright we gotta find Andrew and get out of here Approach oh, the buck door. Kick down the next door. So you approach the door, Buck. You hear scraping from the other side, and mm, mm. do you ready? Uh, he's going to uh, yep. pull out his pistol and um, gently open the door. Pull out your pistol, Vera. What are you doing as Buck moves to open the door? Um. Yeah, I'm just sort of staying behind the the corner of the wall, so I'm not exposed to the room. Camera uh, but ready. makes a motion to um, Trixie, um, like with his fingers, to uh, cover him with her rifle. Yep. Do you do so, Trixie? Do do. And then Buck leans forwards, kicks the door, and with a crash, it bursts open. <laughs> the first thing you see is that there's only one person in the room. The bound, gagged, 
humiliated, very hungry, very frightened form of Andrew Keatling sits in the corner of this otherwise completely bare room. Around him, there are dark brown stains on the carpet and the floorboards and the scent of urine and feces sits lingering in the air. He's been lying in his own filth, perhaps for weeks. His eyes go wide as he sees you enter. A flicker of recognition seems to dawn on his face. He looks at you, his gaunt, sunken face telling you in no words at all, get me out of here. He's going to kneel down to him and try to calm him down. Vera's taking a photo. Keep quiet. We'll get yep. you out of here. Vera? Yeah, Buck's going to be just um, searching the room as well, just like checking the corners, making sure. Yep. Because Buck. You Josephine sweep, isn't somewhere hiding. You sweep the room, and there's no furniture. There's nowhere Josephine could be hiding, but there is a closet. And just to be sure, you make your way over to it, brandish your pistol, and pull the door open. But there's nothing inside. Go ahead, Vera. Make a photography check for me. Yeah, and. After she, I, I rolled a one, so I think that yeah. succeeds. Yeah. But um, after that, she's going to approach him, and she's probably going to start asking him questions about like what's going on, what, how, how long he's been there, yada yada, basic journalist shit. You fix the gaunt, tortured face of Andrew Keatling in your viewfinder and snap the photo. Ka-ching! This is the money shot. This is what will be on the front page of the paper, the headline reading, Boston Socialite Rescued from Unimaginable Terror. And then you approach him as Trixie kneels down, starts to tear off his bindings. And Trixie, before you rip the gag off his mouth, go ahead and make a... go ahead and make an appearance. Or... a psychoanalysis check to calm him down. As he struggles, as he pushes away from you. That is a hard pass of 17. Hard pass, yeah. Hold out your hands. You purse your lips and say, it's okay. We're here to save you. Your sister sent us. She's waiting for you. She misses you. And then you lip... Then you lean forwards and rip the gag off. He doesn't scream. You've calmed him just enough for that. Instead, tears roll down his sunken cheek. His lips curl and he begins to weep. She... she... she's had me... my, my mind, it's... My mind, but not my mind. My mind, but not... My mind, I, I know who you are, I, I recognize your faces, she, she wanted me to kill you, but I, I couldn't, I couldn't. Okay, Trixie, you can go ahead and talk to Josephine. Okay, we've seen a whole lot of this madness ourselves. We'll get you out of here. Is there anything you can tell us? How far away is Josephine? Has she been here recently? She, 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 she said she was heading out. Into the woods. She said she was going to conduct the, the, the ritual tonight. She, she, she's marked me, marked me with that stone of hers. She said she split, split my mind in two. Half of me tethered to this realm, the other half to the realm of dreams. And tonight, she'll make sure the assumption, the assumption of night will come to pass. Oh, that means you can't. We'll get you out of here. Um, the snow, did, did she have it on her? Or did she hide it somewhere? He just nods. She, she has it on her person at all times. She, she said, she said it's the vessel through which, through which the one beyond c- c- communicates with her and she says it's brought her closer, brought him closer to this realm. 
that a portal to the world of dreams has manifested within this very house. And that her guard told her, today is the day that the vessel, the one whose body would sate the gods hunger would arrive and prepare it to pass beyond the veil. All she needs to do is complete the ritual by killing me. We won't let her get to you. We'll be right. And I'm going to turn my head and just mouth angel to the other two. She said, looks wildly around like a cornered animal, not even noticing that Vera's still snapping photos of him. She, she said that when the vessel, when the vessel meets her god, that it will rend the vessel's soul asunder, reduce the body to nothing but strips of meat. The vessel's destiny is to feed the gods hunger and nothing more to spend the rest of eternity languishing as one of the many faces of yog -Sathoth. And at this, he peers up at Vera as she clicks the button once more. I see it. I see it in your face. I don't need to convince you to believe me. You know. You know I'm telling the truth. You've seen it all. Yeah, I know. I just gotta document it. The world must know. The world needs to know how close, how close we are as a species to being snuffed out at the whim of something we cannot even comprehend. We'll worry about that later. First, we've got to find that stone, get you out to safety, and we can work it from there. And avoid whatever could be lurking around here. Do you know any secret escape routes that Josephine might use, the back doors or barricade up. I... I was brought in through the front. I, I don't know what the rest of the house looks like. I... She said she made sure that if anyone had to leave, there was only one way that they could. Either way, we've got to start finding it. What are you thinking about? We should we brute force this or sneak out the front? What do you think, Buck, Vera? I'll take cover behind here and take care of our little friend here. We've all got our own weapons. We've all got a keen eye. So. Yep. Ready for a fight. Well, I got two questions on my mind. Did she do something to the front door to stop us leaving? I... And can we really bring him into her hands? I... I... I, I don't know, says Andrew. P please! Uh, untie me! We have to get out of here before she returns! Hey, Rock, we stay here. He, she's certain to have him. So at least if we get outside the building, there's more chance of him escaping. So either way, we've got to work our way out and make it fit on there. Alright, I got an idea. Let's head downstairs and regroup. Uh, Trixie, you pick up Andrew. Yep, Trixie, I'll Trixie kneels down. She starts to undo the rest of his bindings, and finally, when he's free, 
He just slumps forwards, buries his face in his hands and weeps. <laughs> you help him, help him softly to his feet, Trixie, and he leans on your shoulder as you half guide him, half carry him towards the doorway. Uh, Buck's going to... Uh, yeah, Buck's going to lead the charge down the hallway and down the stairs to the main foyer. Yeah. And Vera, I assume, you're snapping pictures every step of the way. Sure am. Sure am. The whir of... whir of Vera's camera fills the silence, mixing with Andrew's whimpers as you lead him out of the room as Buck brandishes his rifle and leads the way out into the hallway and then down the stairs. Chicking, 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 chicking goes the camera. Your boots and shoes crunch on the stairs the entire staircase rattles and rumbles as the house groans and buck just as you reach the foyer just as the four floorboards rattle underfoot a silhouette appears in the doorway Josephine Garcetti is slightly more than five feet tall. She has strawberry blonde hair, prominent blue eyes, and a very slender build. Her clothing is of the latest style, tastefully displaying just a hint of provocative decadence. Or it would be, were the front of her blouse and skirt not currently spattered with dirt, mud, grime and what seems to be fresh blood the makeup on her face is in patches washed off by tears in some places covered up by dirt and mud in others her eyes are wide crazy bloodshot bloodthirsty her right hand raises a pointing finger in your direction as the fingers in her left hand curl around a figurine made of the darkest stone you've ever seen as they clasp around it the surface of the stone seems to shimmer and for a second her dishevelled hair stands on end as if a sh charge of static electricity shoots through her very being. The time is here, she says. The vessel has fulfilled her purpose. The ritual site is prepared. And now the assumption of eternal night shall begin. I will ask you nicely. Turn the sacrifice over to me. I sent the dream ghoul to kill you. I weaponized the aspect of his soul that exists on the other side. Sent it to stop you in your tracks. But you got here anyway. And for that, I'm willing to let you live. But I will not let you leave with Andrew Keatling. You know that's a hollow statement. You know that damn well. If you pull this off, none of us survive. Doesn't matter if you walk out of here, we'll be dead before the end of the night. She smiles. When the eternal night falls, you won't die. You'll live in paradise. We'll all be in paradise. Don't you see? It's in your best interests to do as I say. 
and you'll be rewarded by God. Everything the Here. Chapel of Contemplation has worked towards for the last 200 years will come to pass, and humanity will ascend to a higher state of being. Fear sort of parks out from behind her camera, and she says, uh, Can you uh, describe this paradise, ma'am? A paradise? A world of never-ending dreams? She says as she smiles. Yogg-Sothoth. He is the key and the bridge, the bringer of dreams. Your wildest dreams can come true. You'll live for eternity surrounded by the greatest desires your mind can imagine. I've been having some pretty rough dreams lately. There's no such thing, she says, shaking her hand, pursing her lips. No such thing as nightmares. They're simply visions in another sense. Every dream has a meaning. There's nothing to be scared of. They're glimpses into how the world truly works. This is still going in the notebook, by the way. Yeah, you're just scribbling it down as she talks. Now, she says, raising the stone figure. I know that gangster, that insect, has sent you to reclaim this. He can't come himself, for I've set up wards against him. Not that he would show his face. <laughs> After I marked him with the power given to me by yogg -Sothoth. I caused his dream self to manifest, and it stripped him of his human form. I can do the same to you. I can do worse. But I won't. If you give Andrew to me. Help me usher in eternal paradise, and you will be rewarded with your lives and with your greatest desires. You know what my greatest desire is? Uchi, if you just stood still. And I'm going to take a shot at her. <laughs> Ooh, nice. I was going to say Buck is about to take a shot yeah. at her as All right. well, so you might as well do it in tandem. So Buck and Trixie, go ahead, make firearms checks for me. I'm going to push that because the 99 ain't too good. Oh, oh. Uh, <laughs> critical that success a, in the six. That is a hard pass. Ah, <laughs> oh, nice. So. That was a warning shot. <laughs> she is... <laughs> She is going to try to dodge, obviously, as she sees you raise your gun, suddenly her eyes go wide. She realises that whatever she says, she can't talk you down, and she scrambles for cover. She's going to roll her dodge, and she's going to roll it twice to see if she's able to get out of the way. That's a 70, and that's a 21. So, as Buck fires... Bang! She throws herself to the ground and, crawling on all fours, scrambles into the living room behind a moth-bitten green sofa. She pokes her head out to take stock of the situation, and that's when, bang, Trixie fires. Go ahead, Trixie, roll damage, and for a rifle, that will be... I will just check... Uh, start a set rules. And also, that's oh. going to be a critical, so that will be... I'd like you to go ahead and roll for me, uh, Trixie. 2d6 plus 4. It did Buck's shot miss? Yeah, she dodged Buck's, but not Trixie's. Oh dang, he rolled a 22. Yeah, but Trixie got the critical. Hey. That is 
nine. Yeah, okay. tricks is enough talking. <laughs> and because it's a critical, <laughs> because it's a critical, you get an extra one d six of damage. Oh hell yeah! I'm gonna blow a head clean. That's off. a ten. <laughs> That's a ten. Extra one. Yeah. Right. Ten points of damage. She pokes her head out and with her right hand raises the stone idol behind the brim of the couch. It begins to glow brightly with energy as she opens her mouth to begin to chant and then BANG! The rifle bullet hits her right in the forehead and with a thump she clatter- she falls dead. Her head exploding like a fruit dropped from the second floor onto concrete. Her fingers twitch and the dark stone falls away, clattering onto the floorboards. The surface of the stone shimmers once more and then it grows inert once again, a deep black. You got very lucky. She was about to cast Drain Youth, which would have made her target, which would have been Trixie, as the one who last spoke to her, make an opposed power check. And on a failure, she would have drained 3d6 health straight out of Trixie's body. Oh, she would have been fucked. <laughs> Good I'm glad that critical success was after that critical fail. Jesus. Trixie. She was, by all accounts, dangerous, murderous, and would almost have certainly have killed you if you didn't fire. But seeing the light in her eyes go out, seeing her skull cleave neatly in two from your round, I'd like you to make a sand check, please. Yeah, no surprise. <laughs> that is... 77 is a fail. A fail. You lose 1d6 sen. Only one somehow. Only one. You're lucky. <laughs> Behind you, Andrew Keatling whimpers. <laughs> And Vera, I'd like you to make a photography check to see if you get the exact moment the bullet hits her. Ooh, that'd be a good shot. I'm gonna push it, because I reckon you want a hard pass, judging by the way you Yeah, hard pass. It. A split second. It might be uh, hard, pass. hard pass. Hard pass. Click. Were. I'm pretty sure you got it. You're not sure what paper will publish this, but... You think you've captured the exact moment of Josephine Garcetti's death. And... <laughs> so fucked up shit. <laughs> if anything... It's going the personal album. It'll add... That final... Shocking note... To the story. The foyer of the house... Is deathly silent. Save for... Andrew Keatling's continued whimpering. If anything, shooting Garcetti dead in front of him has disturbed him even more. He's sunk to his knees on the floorboards and is openly crying. <laughs> the dark stone lies discarded on the floorboards. Spe of Josephine's blood painting the surface. Trixie's just going to stand there frozen, just whispering, get it, get it, get it. She's going to be too traumatised to move for the moment. And who's going to get it? Uh, Buck's going to speak up. Uh, Josephine mentioned something about um, Zeke wanting it as well and that she cursed him. So he's going to just generally ask whether he think whether uh, everyone thinks it's a good idea that we bring it to him instead. Vera, Trixie, what do you think? 
Definitely not, but we could have figure out a way to so not have his goose settled to us. Josephine's to be believed. She used the powers granted by the stone to strip his human form and force him to live in the body of his dream self. She has essentially cursed him to spend the rest of his existence in the form of that grotesque insect-like monster that you saw. Now you understand why he desperately wants the stone back. He thinks, perhaps, that he can reverse his fate. But maybe he's wrong. Maybe, once you've been marked by the one beyond, maybe that's it. This thing is way too dangerous to keep around. I'm not making an executive decision. All right, Trixie, let's see if your uh, theory holds up. And he's going to uh, make to delicately pick up the uh, pick up the stone. So, Buck, creep into the living room, and then hovering over the stone, you take a breath, and you gingerly reach down, grip the cold crystalline figure, and lift it up, holding it in front of you. It's carved in the image of what appears to be a mummified corpse. And as you hold it in front of you, you swear for a moment. You see its sunken face move. You see its eyes look up at you. And its tiny lips twist into a smile. But you blink, shake your head, look over your shoulders to check the others. And when you look back, it's inert once again. Buck, I'd like you to make a Cthulhu Mythos check for me, please. Uh, that's a fail. I think I should probably push this one, though. What's your Mythos? What's yours? Uh, 12. Ah. No, that's still a fail, 26. Still a fail? So as you hold it in your hands, you don't feel any different. No strange otherworldly voices speak in your mind. No one tells you to commit a sacrifice and you don't feel the power that everyone, every text has claimed flows from this thing. There is no connection between you and the thing hanging in the void. And here is where I reveal that Buck, over the course of the campaign, you are the only character who did not go temporarily insane, at least once. Um, no, he didn't actually. That's right. Your mind has remained closed to the mythos. Your humanity has not yet been eroded by things that lie beyond this world. And suddenly, you realise that in your hands, you can end this. The stone has the power to exile any remaining follower of the god from this world and thus end this once and for all. Only one who rejects the connection between themselves and the god of dreams is capable of utilising the energy in the stone for this purpose. 
He's gonna give it a crack. There's more to it. Don't know how that works, but... <laughs> There's more to it, but you failed your Cthulhu Mythos check, so you still have to wing it a bit. So, Vera and Trixie, you see Buck holding the stone in both hands, looking down into its face, contemplating it. And you half expect him to turn around and resume Josephine Garcetti's intended attack. But he doesn't. As he lowers the stone to his side and turns around, Buck's face is neutral, unchanged. Why didn't it... It didn't shatter. What are we Yeah, I'm as confused as you are. I thought it just turned to dust or something. Was I wrong? Are you feeling compelled or were you feeling any energy from it? Are you feeling anything at all? Uh, feeling the same compulsion I always feel to drink, but... That's about it. Huh. Well, what do we do? We can't... We can't give it to Zeke, and we can't stay here. An- an- Angel's here somewhere. Yeah, if Angel was here, she'd probably be, like, gloating that this stone's obviously a fake, because it's not doing anything. <laughs> put it past. Um, can I do some... archaeology? Don't know. Can I do a check to see... If I recognise if it's a normal stone. Yeah. So you and Vera can both attempt Cthulhu Mythos checks, but as you're not the one holding the stone, you do it with disadvantage. And Buck will not be letting them touch it. Yeah. Most likely. Definitely not. So what was the check? Cthulhu Mythos, but with disadvantage. So roll two (laughs) dice, take the highest. Oh, this this will will go great. I have three. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, uh, shockingly, I failed that one. You can spend luck, because, you know, this Uh, is the end. I can't spend that much luck. Yeah. Yeah, No luck here. No luck here. I think it's high time we uh, paid a visit to Zika ourselves. Yeah. Are you ready for the climax? So Buck notices how Andrew's still crying in the corner and um, takes his uh, takes his gaze away from the stone and slips it into his pocket and just starts walking out the door, kind of uh, gesturing vaguely at them to follow him. Buck steps through the door into the bright afternoon sunlight and you follow behind him. You hear the sound of boots crunching on dirt and ahead of you, in the haze of sunlight, you see two silhouettes. The two gangsters step out of the light in front of you, brandishing Tommy guns. Chucky the Rat sneers. Well, uh, you know, we figured uh, if you took care of the broad, maybe her uh, little spell might wear off. Turns out we was right. So, uh, they cock their guns. Give us the stone, and we'll give you the money. Nice and easy. Do a spot hidden check to see if there's anything that resembles a black stone. (laughs) I can swap it out for. Um, go ahead. That is a ten. 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 That's part. You look around, freezing on the spot, trying not to startle these men, and you notice, just behind your right foot, under the first step leading up to the patio, there's a dirty pebble about the size of your palm. It's covered in a deep black mud. Oh, 
what you want me to do. I'll bend down like I'm picking something out of my um my pant leg, like I'm hiding it. I'd this like... is the closest thing that we could find. This is all yeah. she had on her. I'd like you, Trixie, to make a sleight of hands check. Oh, past my turn twenty-seven. Oh, thank God. <laughs> oh, thank God. So, at Buck and Vera, as you stand there, your your gun raised, Buck pointed towards these men. Vera holding the camera, and one of the men gestures the stone. Trixie You're not aware saying, yeah. of Trixie kneeling down, grabbing for something on the ground, looking as if she's adjusting the hem of her leg. And then she steps forwards, holds out her palm, revealing a jagged rock that looks like it was just picked up out of the dirt except it's deep black and she says this is all, this we, is can all we can find by the, persons. the two men exchange glances didn't uh didn't the boss say it's supposed to be like a figurine or something yeah yeah figurines what he said but would you look at that it's a black rock i mean i ain't never seen a rock that dark before uh, Buck attempts to, uh, kind of, uh, catch them off guard and, uh, steps forward with his gun pointed at them. The money. Now. They look at each other. Buck, make an intimidate check for me. Oh, finally something he can do. <laughs> uh, that is a hard pass. Thirteen. Okay, 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 says Chucky the Rat. Aight, you did the best you could. It's a black stone. Boss should have been more specific. They reach into their coats and they each pull out a paper envelope. They shrug and then toss the envelopes into the dirt at their feet. Now, the stone, says Chucky, still training his Tommy gun on Trixie with one hand while he holds out the other. Don't want to keep this gentleman waiting. Trixie, as you step forwards to give him the stone, make a spot hidden check for me, please. That is a 33, that's a pass. Is it a hard pass? Um, hang on, one second, I'll write that out again. Hard pass is hard. Yeah, no, it's just a just regular, regular pass. You think you see a flicker of movement out of the corner of your eye, somewhere above, but when you look, it's just a clear blue sky and clouds. You shrug and place the black stone into the man's outreaching palm. The two gangsters lower their Tommy guns, flash a smile. Ah, see, no need for trouble. We didn't need to... Suddenly, he stops talking. Mid-sentence. The two men face each other, their eyes glazed over. And then the man you just handed the rock to opens his fingers, allows it to tumble out of his grasp onto the dirt. With superhuman speed, he raises his Tommy gun, points it at his, at his friend, as does the other. Both of them scream, ah! as their fingers pull the triggers and they riddle each other with bullets. Their bloodied carcasses slump to the ground, the dirt already painted with their gore. And then a voice booms from the sky. You may have fooled my men, but you'll never fool me. You see that flicker of movement again, Trixie. And this time, everyone else sees it. You stare up into the sky and there, diving down from cloud cover, you see Zeke Crater, the true Zeke Crater, between eight and ten feet in height. 
The creature is vaguely insectile. It has four primary limbs and four secondary whip-like appendages ending in bony hooked blades. The two primary limbs located near the narrow head are equipped with 15 jointed hook-like fingers. The lowermost legs support most of the weight of the creature and end in splayed claws. The head is banded with gleaming rows of bulb-shaped eyes and it has large, curved mandibles endowed with great strength. Its wide, delicate-looking wings account for much of its size. They are reminiscent of a bat's, but the membranes are translucent and milky in colour. As these bat-like wings flap, carrying this monstrosity down towards you, I'd like everyone to make a sand check, please. It was one thing to see, to catch a glimpse of him, in the flickering light of the office, but here, in broad late afternoon daylight, it's quite another thing entirely. Fail. Fail. Pass. Pass. Uh, pass. Pass. So if you pass, if you pass, it is a sun loss of 1d6. If you failed, that is a sun loss of 1d20. Oh, Christ. <laughs> Vera's uh, getting the eight. Eight. Oof. Oh, Vera, no. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Buck, Trixie. Pass. I don't I don't know how Trixie's staying sane through all these sand checks. Just right, like, so if you pass two. 1d6, so go ahead and roll that. That's yeah, a three. One. <laughs> one. Ooh. Vera. Vera, this is it. As you see him flying down towards you, the light catches his face at just the right angle. And for a brief second, this terrifying insect appears to be almost human. You see your Uncle Robert's face smiling down at you. Come on, little girl. He seems to be saying, Let's go dig up a mystery together. Uncle and niece, just like the old times. Make an intelligence check for me, please, Vera. Yep. Um, I'm going to push that. Can I push that? Sure. Oh, uh, critical pass. Critical pass. So let me ask, did you fail it the first time? Oh, I don't want to pass. Yeah, I don't want to pass, do you? don't want to pass. I then. failed the first yeah, time. Yeah, so you're fine. You... Your mind is still buzzing with thoughts of breaking the story at an almost fever pace now. You are insane. But with an insane devotion to telling your story, the fact that your mind is trying to process this thing before you by forcing it into the shape of your uncle does not even register. Instead, you raise your camera Fix it in the viewfinder as it swoops towards you. And you decide you're going to try to catch this monster on camera in broad daylight. Go ahead for me, and in your temporary insanity, make me a hard photography check. Oh, I'm, I'm pushing. Oh, god damn it! I wasted the eight. Uh, that's a fail. You press the button multiple times. You're out of film. No, 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 no. I need this! I need this! You scream, smashing the button over and over each time the camera clicks. But there's no whir. The little number above the viewfinder reads zero. And nothing you do changes it. Ah, should have replaced the film, says Robert Chambers. You always should carry an extra roll. Remember what I taught you? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I do, I do. And she, she probably starts fumbling through her bag. Try to find it. Meanwhile, Zeke continues his descent. His eyes fixed on the one who tried to fool him, Trixie. 
and we go into the final few rolls of the campaign. Trixie, he's bearing down towards you, and Buck, you can see by his trajectory that he's barreling towards Trixie. He has taken her attempt to trick him, her successful attempt at fooling his men as a personal offence. Uh, since Buck's pistol's drawn, he's just going to train it and uh, shoot straight for straight for Santa Mass. Straight Maybe for very Santa slightly Mass. To he hits. Straight for Santa Mass. Okay. Uh, let me check something. Ah, yeah, that's 70. So what's your, your uh, dex? Uh, my dex? Yeah. 70. 70. So you've got the same dex, but in Call of Cthulhu, if you state that you have a weapon drawn before you take your turn, that adds plus 50 to your dex. So right now, you've got the drop on him. So as he... <laughs> as he flaps his bat-like wings and roars, you'll die for this insult! I'll sacrifice you to the one beyond! You raise your gun, fix his insectile face in your sights, and fire. Go ahead, make a firearms check. Whoop, gonna re-roll that. Uh, 72, that's a pass. That's a pass, okay. Go ahead and roll your damage. And that will be, I believe, 1d6 plus 1d4 for your magnum. Uh, that's 1d10 plus 1d4 plus yeah, 2. One. That's it, yep, that's the one. So, uh, so that's a 9 plus... Uh, I gotta find a 4, sorry, one second. Nine plus four plus two. Nine plus four plus two. So that's fifteen. Fifteen. Your bullet slams into his hard armor-like carapace, striking a bit of it off and making his trajectory slightly veer to the left. His armor absorbs eight points of your damage, leaving him to take seven but it's enough damage that he roars in pain he struggles to stay afloat flapping his wings but he quickly rights himself and continues his descent towards Trixie his whip like appendages lashing through the air Trixie would you like to try to shoot him or would you like to try to dodge either way you'll get to do it with advantage because he's been knocked off course by Buck's successful hit. I'm gonna try and just dodge that. Dodge that, go ahead, dodge it, and you get a you get to do it with advantage. The Buck hasn't taught you how to shoot yet. I've got a headshot, I know how to shoot. Oh my god, that is a dodge, dodge, dodge. pass. Pass, alright. If he gets a hard pass or a critical pass. He will still beat you. Here we go. While I'm passing, I'm gonna um, scream out to him. You blood, you idiot! Angel has a stone. <laughs> you think we're just got... gonna hand off to your bloody goons? So his whip claws. He's got seventy percent on those, and he rolled a thirty-five, which is exactly half. So. You hit the you, you you think of firing your rifle, but he's moving way too fast, so instead you throw yourself forwards, hitting the dirt, trying to dodge him, but his whip-like appendage catches you by the hem of your shirt, lifts you up into the air, and as he lifts you to his feet, his two top appendages, the ones that end in sharp claws, lash down, eating into your skin, tearing your flesh and clothing as he laughs. And that's going to be 2d6 of damage. Let me roll that. That is 11 points of damage, Trixie. 
exactly my hit points. Is that exactly your hit points? Yep. Mm, unfortunately, if they meet, if they deal your maximum or higher in a single attack, that's it. Trixie screams, Angel! Angel has it! As his talons dig into Trixie's neck and rip her head clean off. Dumb broad. He spits as he tosses her headless carcass into the dirt. Now standing in front of Buck and Vera. Vera who's still desperately fumbling for spare film. He begins to stumble forwards, holding himself kind of like a man, but moving with that robotic, unnatural gait you remember from the night before. Give me the stone! What do you do, Buck? And Vera, you may make a power check to see if you're able to recover from your temporary insanity. So I want to pass against power? Yep, you want to pass on this. I got a four, so that's four, that's a critical. Yeah. As you as you remove your hand from your dress pocket and withdraw an extra roll of film, the panic disappears. Seeing this creature, Zeke Crater, in front of you, seeing Trixie's lifeless corpse bleeding into the dirt to your left, you realise. Your life is on the line, and you wrench back control of your faculties. Shit! Uh, uh, I'm here, fuck, I'm here, uh, what, fuck, what? Get inside. Okay, okay. She, yeah. Yep, so you're gonna, Ms. Vera, you're gonna turn and run? Yep. Alright. Vera, you turn and run towards the house, and as you do, you hear Crater laugh. <laughs> Another dumb broad as he flaps his wings and gives chase, shrieking like a monster as he zooms through the air. Go ahead and make a dex check for me, please, Vera. Yep. Um, uh, I pushed it, and I came one short, so I'm spending luck on that. Luck, go ahead. All right, so that's a normal pass. Yeah. He'll catch you if he gets a hard or higher, but you're lucky. He rolled a 50 and his dex is 70, so that's a regular pass for him. So he nearly catches you. You feel the end of one of his whip-like appendages wrapping around your ankle just as you reach the top of the patio, but you grunt, pull it away and sprint through the doors, slamming them shut behind you. You hear a loud thump as his body collides with the door and you get away by the skin of your skin of your teeth a fraction of a second longer and he would have caught you you hear him growl from the other other side all right then he says as he whirls around on the patio and locks gaze with buck you want to die alone so be it give me the stone or I'll tear you to shreds in the name of Yogg-Sothoth. Buck, before you take your turn, I will let you make a Cthulhu Mythos check. Uh, I will do so. Let me get my, my dice back. Come on. He still hasn't passed any of these. And push it and spend luck if you like. Uh, still hasn't. Still hasn't passed. One. It hasn't passed. All right. In that case, I'll allow you to make an intelligence check. If you pass it, you'll get some information, but not all. Sorry, my headphones uh, died for a second. I, uh, did. He something. did not pass, but he's going to make an intelligence check to see. That's a regular pass. In a regular pass? Okay. You stare down the monster as he begins to clamber down the stairs and crunch along the dirt trail. 
getting closer and closer to you is whip tendrils flicking in the air around him. You feel the stone in your hand vibrate as you turn and stare at it. You realize the power to send those marked by the god of dreams to their paradise. You need to spend five magic points for each attempt, and then you need to succeed on an opposed power roll. If you had passed your Cthulhu check, you'd know there's an additional component of the spell. But this is all I'm telling you. You may attempt it and see what happens. Okay, question. My Magnum has an attacks 1 brackets 3. So that means you can fire attack. it up to 3 times in a round. The second time, it's done with disadvantage, and then the third time, it's done with disadvantage, but three dice. But you can fire it up to three times per round, that means. He's going to stick to that, I think. Yep. All right. So you've got higher decks than him, because you've got your gun drawn, so go ahead, roll your firearms. Are you going to fire three times? Three times. Alright, so well, let's go first. with the first one first. Uh, that is a hard pass. Hard pass on the first. Okay, roll the second with disadvantage. Uh, that's a fail. It's a fail. Alright, roll the third, this time with three dice. Uh, that is a, another hard pass. Hard pass, alright. Roll your damage twice for me. Okay. The first is uh, another 15. 15, yep. So 8 gets absorbed, and he takes 7. And the second is a 12. Ezekiel Crater is listed in this book as having 20 HP. With your first attack, 8 points were absorbed by the carapace, leaving 7, bringing him down to 13. As the second bullet, as the second bullet, the first in this volley, hits his carapace and blasts a piece away, another eight points gets get absorbed, leaving another seven points of damage, which brings him down to six. And then, bang! You fire one more time, the bullet slams into his carapace, breaking off yet another piece that clatters to the ground, falling into the mud. Eight points get absorbed, leaving four. He has two HP left. He's oozing pale green blood out of various points on his body. He's still, still alive and desperately trying to get you. He's going to try to get you, but he's going to be rolling with disadvantage. I'd like you to make a dodge check for me, please, Buck. Ooh, more things he's gonna Excellent. Uh, that is another hard pass. Hard Sorry, pass. no, that's a critical pass. Critical pass. Right, here we go. Critical pass. He's probably not gonna be able to hit you. Nope, because he only got a hard pass. He reaches out with one of his talons, tries to hook it into you. But he's wounded and slightly slower than he should be. You sidestep and raise your gun. This time it's your turn to laugh at him. Vera, your face is pressed against the dust-covered window pane. You've seen him just take a barrage of bullets from Buck. And the way he's pulling himself along the ground, the way he's dragging his body, it looks like he's on the verge of death, but he is still up. Is there anything you would like to do? 
first of all, did I get the camera loaded? You have managed to get the camera loaded. Okay. Ah, uh, torn between <laughs> two two instincts here. Um. Look, if Fira looks over to you, what is what is what is she seeing? Like, is is he communicating anything with her at all? At the moment, he's just like uh, looking over to make sure that she's safe. It's like flicking his eyes to the window every now and then. Yeah. So he's not communicating anything in particular. Maybe but if she tries maybe he'll, anything he'll was telling her to stay where she is. Internally, he's uh, absolutely not letting another person die on his watch, especially somebody related to Chambers. Yeah. If she tries something, he'll probably play along, like, to his best, but he's not communicating anything in particular. Okay. I, I, I think her gut sinks at doing it, but she just stays safe and keeps taking photos for now. Go ahead, roll me a photography check. At the pass. No, that's a hard pass. Hard pass. That's the last roll of the campaign. Oh, Vera. Fuck. <laughs> you don't, you know Buck wants you to stay away. He's pleading with the look on his face. Stay there. Don't put yourself in danger. Don't put yourself in danger. And you don't. You merely grab the window pane, slide it open, and to lean out fixing this bleeding, dying monstrosity that was Seek Crater in your viewfinder. As he draws closer to Buck, only a metre or so away, as he raises his talons, as his whip coils preparing to lasso Buck's body and pull him in for the kill, you fix him right in the centre of the viewfinder with your right thumb. You flick the knob, turning the flash up as high as it will go. And then you smile. Click! The flash is so bright that it pierces the haze of late afternoon sunlight. Buck, when you see Vera raise the camera, you know what she's going to do. So you have the presence of mind to shut your eyes a split second before her finger presses the button. As soon as you hear the telltale click and the whir, you open them. <laughs> Crater's stumbling, his head covered in compound eyes, all of them reeling in blinding pain. The chitin just under one of his limbs has been sheared clean off by your bullets. You can see the soft pink flesh underneath. Reach into your coat, pull out the knife, flip open the blade and rush in. And as you sink the blade into the flesh, as you hear him squirm, ah! as pale green blood oozes out onto your hand and this insect struggles vainly at the end of your knife. What do you say? Yeah, tell Angel I say hello. <laughs> Run! Spits Zeke as the insectoid creature falls limp. You retract your blade and it falls to the ground. It barely hits the dirt before pieces of its body start to break away, crumbling into ash before your eyes. The ash sinks into the mud, disappearing beneath the surface. 
He's gone. Vera is rushing out to Buck's side. Vera rushes out, bursts through the door, and runs down the muddy dirt track towards Buck, who's still standing there. Oh my there, god, Buck! Grasping his knife, covered in greenish ooze. Oh my it, god, I thought that was. That was gonna be it. You, oh my god, you got him! Uh, Buck is way too preoccupied about Trixie and um, runs over to um, go inspect what's left of her. Yeah. Her body's mostly intact. The head's lying in the dirt off the edge of the trail, lying on top of the patch of foliage a few metres away. She didn't even have time to react to what was happening. Her face is forever frozen in an expression of intense pain and terror. Her eyes still wide with the fear of death. He just uh, takes a moment to close her eyes and just reflects on it. There's been way too many people have died for his taste. For anyone's taste, really. As he gingerly lifts her head, pulls her eyelids shut, and carries it over to her body and kneels down, softly lowering it onto her chest. He feels something shaking in his right hand. He looks down to see the black stone. A long crack runs through the front of it, down the surface, its face torn in two. Crack grows bigger and bigger, and then just like Zeke Crater before you, the polished black crystal dissolves into flakes of ash trailing through Buck's fingers down onto Trixie's body, like some sort of macabre funeral ritual. Uh, I know the lengths that uh, some people would go to to bring someone like this back, but it ain't gonna be me. Vera? Yeah, I think Vera doesn't really know how to handle this. Yeah, she's uh, probably just, after everything. She's probably either frozen solid or crying. I think she's just sort of silently crying. She, I don't even think she's aware of it. And she just grabs Buck and pulls him close. And stares off into the distance with her thousand yard stare. We fade out. And Toxie. Angel. Angel frolics in paradise, frolics through the field of flesh-coloured flowers, dances in the shade of gnarled trees made out of bone instead of bark. And as she looks up into the roiling chaos above and sees her god lingering, floating in his void, she is happy. You hear footsteps, something rustling in the field behind you, Angel. You whirl around to see Zeke Crater and Josephine Garcetti walking side by side towards you. In unison, they look up, taking in the sight of their god, and then they lower their heads staring right into your very soul. You're happy that they've found paradise, but it's a lingering hint of sadness. Just a hint 
in the pit of your stomach. There's no sign of Trixie. Buck. Tell me. In the aftermath of these events, when the adrenaline has died down, when you've had the chance to numb the trauma with copious amounts of alcohol from your hip flask, when you and Vera have had the opportunity to make sure that make sure that Trixie at the very least is given the proper burial that she deserves what do you do? I think his, his last thing that he would do before he goes on his own little soul seeking journey is help Vera in any way that he can to um, get the article published and um, uh, sort of sort through sort through all the information and work through the photos, try and help her in any way that he can so yeah. that she can have a, have that boost she needs to have her life. Yeah. Go ahead. Make a law check for me. Uh, that is a super fail. He is not going <laughs> to fail. Doesn't because know shit. You can push it. There's no consequence for failing this push. This is the epilogue. Still not a chance, no. Still not a chance. 5% is not going to happen. He tries his best, but in the end, all he's able to do is make sure a proper funeral for Trixie is arranged. She makes contacts with her next of kin and all of her colleagues at the Boston <laughs> Museum end up pitching in a little bit for her memorial service. For the most part, what he's able to do for Vera is to stay strong, to be her rock, to be there when she questions herself, when she questions whether whether she's doing the right thing by making sure this story is told. Vera, what do you do? I think that Vera is the type who sort of just tried to put this all behind her and, and still go about getting that story published. Yeah. With Buck's help, she tries to do her very best to move on. She doesn't know how. There's no way her life can continue on. At least with the sense of normality that she lived before. The things she's seen will never, ever leave her. But at the very least, she can make sure that what she experienced, the things she went through and the people that died beside her did not happen in vain. Go ahead and write, do a own language check for me. Should be fine. Uh, <clears throat> critical pass. Critical pass. She spends the next few months piecing together her story bit by bit. She interviews Trixie's next of kin at the funeral. Is able to get enough background to write a two-page feature on Trixie's life to really bring her to life to tell the public what kind of person she was. She sorts through her photos and it doesn't really matter that no newspaper in the world would ever publish such an outlandish story because Vera's got something else in mind. The many, many photos she's gathered. Although she didn't catch any direct evidence of monsters or the supernatural, she still has more than enough to tell the story. Tell the story with just enough gaps that her readers 
can use their imaginations to fill in the rest. On September 12th, 1928, almost two years since these horrific events, Vera's book becomes a New York Times bestseller. She's quite sure that 99% of people who read it think it's nothing more than bunk some tabloid journalist doing her very best to fill a book with yellow journalism and to entertain more to inform but she knows she knows from the letters she receives from the people she meets at the signings that there's that one percent out there those who understand there are things beyond mortal ken things that vera has seen that they could never comprehend and that's just enough to make vera feel as if everything had a purpose one last question for you vera what do you title the book oh Give me a second. There and back again, a hobbit's journey. <laughs> <laughs> there Sorry, Hazzy, you can't be spotlight back. There and back again, a niece's journey. Either way, it becomes... It becomes a favourite for all sorts. The main audience, the ones who made it a bestseller, quickly move on to other things. But there's a group of people out there, the ones who, if they were ever to meet Trixie, would have got along just fine with her, and maybe some of the ones that are a little like Angel, that cherish this book. And all of them own at least one copy of There and Back Again, A Niece's Journey. Okay, we're not calling it an air back at Denise's journey. We're calling it In Restless Dreams. In Restless Dreams. I see that book, Vera's book, on their bookshelves. Where it will remain an integral part of the culture of paranormal investigators for decades to come. And after that life returns to normality as far as it can get to normality Andrew Keatling has returned to his sister but he doesn't stay in the Keatling home for long a few weeks after you return from Muskrat Rapids you receive a letter from Sarah Keatling her brother has been committed to Roxbury, in Sil- Roxbury Asylum has been declared hopelessly clinically insane and there he remains for the rest of his days Vera riding high from the money and fame that her book brings her lives in luxury for a decade or two she tries to drown the trauma, trauma in booze and partying and excess but when she gets older when she settles down and every night when she's partied herself into a stupor and sleep finally catches her she's back there back in Muskrat Rapids back in Garcetti's house living the nightmare again for the rest of her life. And Buck... Buck turns to drink. His hip flask becomes two hip flasks, and then three. And then when Prohibition ends, he's never seen without 
a telltale paper bag and a full bottle of whiskey on his person. Those who he called his friends, his family, eventually drift away from him as he falls deeper, deeper into the bottle. But Vera's always there. The only other person alive in this world who understands what he's been through. And perhaps that's enough. Every night when he climbs into bed, he drunkenly stumbles across his bedroom and pulls the sheets over his face. His nightmares are plagued by one constant image. Angel smiling that insufferable smug smirk of hers, shaking her head, whispering, I told you so. And that concludes Call of Cthulhu, The Edge of Madness. Yogg-Sothoth has been dispelled. The plans of the Chapel of Contemplation foiled. The chapel itself destroyed. A forgotten footnote in history. But there are others out there. Others whose minds will always be drawn to questioning things that man was not meant to know. And it's only a matter of time before the great old ones turn their gaze towards humanity once again. It could be centuries from now, it could be decades from now, could be a week, but for now, you've postponed the inevitable, and in Call of Cthulhu, that's a win. Congratulations. Yay.